Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all participants. Uh, now, now we are starting the day two or our first IDM session in 2022. And I would like to give the floor to I am Deputy Director General Ugochi Daniels. Ugochi, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dejan. Good morning, good afternoon, um, distinguished guests, panelists, participants, colleagues, and welcome very much to this second day of the IDM, which is centered on facilitating regular migration. And as part of this, the panel today focuses on legal identity as an, as an enabler of regular migration and access to rights. Access to other human rights does not depend on the possession of a registered legal identity by a competent authority, since all human rights are inherent to all people. Indeed, any individual exists before the law by his or her mere existence, Article 6 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and legal identity conferred by a state is declarative. Yet, proof of legal identity, including proof of nationality, is a requirement for crossing international borders and internal checkpoints in a regular manner. And adequate documentation is key to participate in admission and stay processes to obtain a visa or permit, access family reunification, and for safe and dignified return and reintegration. Over the next few minutes, our distinguished panelists will share some insights on how states and key stakeholders, such as IOM and our UN partners, can strengthen regular pathways and admission and stay processes by working towards universal access to legal identity. Best practices such as the ones we will learn about today are crucial to guide the road ahead for implementation of the Global Compact on Migration and likewise ensure that mobility during and after COVID-19 is accessible to all. IOM is very pleased to be part of the UN Legal Identity Task Force a group of 13 UN agencies delivering on the commitment of the 2030 Agenda to provide legal identity for all, a key enabler of rights and protection for people on the move. This work is also linked to the recently launched UN Common Agenda, which underpins identity for all as a central tenant to accessing justice. Lastly, before passing the floor to our distinguished panelists, allow me to take a moment to share some news related to IOM's work to support universal access to legal identity. Our first ever forthcoming institutional strategy on legal identity aims to tackle several challenges related to people on the move and access to documentation and will be launched imminently. Through this strategy, IOM will step up its efforts to deliver non-discriminatory access to legal identity documentation through adequate and rights compliant systems for all migrants, irrespective of their legal status. IOM's approach includes a strong focus on gender and protection, noting that migrants in vulnerable situations and often women and girls may face greater challenges when it comes to accessing registration and identity documents. Legal identity holds the key for safe and regular migration. So while the right to a legal identity is universally recognized, estimates suggest approximately 1.1 billion people lack access to documented legal identity across the globe. These include migrants, IDPs, refugees, and returnees. As an enabler of sustainable development, which directly intersects with regular migration, universal access to legal identity is a cross-cutting issue for migration management and for the fulfillment of several commitments under the Global Compact for Migration. These include robust protection schemes for migrants, reducing vulnerabilities, accessing rights and services, and safe and dignified return and reintegration for migrants. 
However, people on the move in particular often face unsurmountable challenges when trying to obtain proof of legal identity. Accessible and non-discriminatory civil registration systems for all are the first step to ensure migrants have access to proof of nationality and documentation. However, many states still lack robust and inclusive civil registration systems or the capacity to use adequate identity and travel documents, linking these to national identity management systems and common databases, as well as consular services to register life events and issue documentation for nationals abroad while safeguarding the right to privacy and protection of personal data. Further strengthening these capacities in countries of origin and through consular representations abroad, as well as stronger cooperation between states on this, remains some of the most important challenges to the provision of adequate documentation to all migrants, regardless of their status. Today, we will learn about successful approaches and practices to effectively tackle the legal identity gap and, in turn, protect the rights and well-being of migrants. Well-functioning civil and consular registration systems, including the capacity to register life events and issue official records abroad, are fundamental to issue proof of legal identity for all and therefore crucial for safe migration. Migrants with proof of legal identity are less likely to resort to irregular channels, which expose them to a number of dangers, including smuggling and trafficking networks, amongst others, enhancing vulnerabilities and entrenching existing inequalities. So I'm extremely excited that we have three outstanding speakers with us today who will present good practices as well as challenges. Now, First and foremost, I'm very pleased that we will have Jaime Vasquez Bracho, Director General for Consular Services at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mexico, who will focus on Matricula Consular ID Card, Mexico's new consular ID card aiming to improve the secure and reliable identification for Mexicans abroad. We will also have, we're also joined by Christoph Tamas, Senior Advisor, Ministry of Justice, Division for Migration, Sweden, who will contribute Sweden's perspective and best practices in achieving objective four of the Global Compact on Migration, which is ensure that all migrants have proof of legal identity and adequate documentation. And last but not least, Neal McCann, Policy Advisor and Project Manager on Legal Identity who will bring UNDP's perspective, looking at the common agenda goals and its work to support legal identity for all and how to leverage partnerships through the UN Legal Identity Task Force and how to improve registration systems, including civil registries and access to documentation systems to ensure they are rights compliant, to address the legal identity commitments found in the SDGs, and the GCM. So um, welcome again, distinguished panelists. I'll start with Mr. Vasquez Bracho. Thank you for, again, thank you for joining us. In your capacity as the Director General of Consular Services, you've been coordinating migration, economic security, and health issues in close collaboration with the Consular Network of Mexico and the United States. So with great pleasure, I'd like to invite you to present Mexico's experience in the implementation of the GCM Objective 4 to establish proof of legal identity as a policy priority. What key, and, what key operational and technical capacities are useful for countries seeking to improve access to civil registry systems and issuance of identity documents in particular regarding information and communication technology solutions with robust data protection measures. And lastly, what best practices exist to better equip consular representatives abroad to provide legal identity related support to migrants, including birth registration and issuance of records 
for vital events? What are some of the recent efforts undertaken regarding capacity development and the exchange of best practices? Mr. Pacho, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, Deputy Director General. I'm very, very pleased and very honored to be part of uh, this panel. Uh, first of all, I'd, I'd like to um, say that uh, I coordinate not only the uh, issuing of documents in the United States, but in all our uh, consular network abroad that consists of uh, 148 offices distributed in 80 countries. And uh, this, of course, includes um, the issuing of Mexican passport, uh, but also our consular ID or matricula consular, which is um, what we're going to speak about today. But before that, uh, I would like to express my gratitude and recognize IOM's uh, strategy in advocating for legal identity in the framework of the Global Compact for Migration and UN's Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we, we believe IOM, IOM's efforts to advocate for legal, identi for legal identity as a, an enabler of human rights uh, through technical workshops that include border management, development of uh, technical capacities and consular assistance, um, strengthen this strategy to promote um, human rights. And, and today, as I said, I'd like to share um, Mexico's experience in issuing uh, our matricula consular or consular ID and um, hopefully uh, share some of our uh, best practices um, to contribute to uh, this um, UN's uh, objectives. So um, first of all, uh, as, as we all know, uh, recognizing legal identity of, of people uh, regardless of their migratory status is fundamental for uh, enabling their access to uh, human rights. This is especially important for, for, uh, for a country like Mexico that has uh, more than 30 million people living abroad, mainly in the United States. Uh, as we all know as well, uh, the lack of legal identity um, is a factor that promotes exclusion and discrimination of people. So it is vital that people have documents that uh, are able to uh, uh, ensure who, who they are and uh, are, uh, allow them to identify themselves before authorities or uh, private entities. In Mexico, uh, legal identity is ensured in uh, Article 4 of our um, constitution. And we also have uh, a law that protects uh, the, the right of uh, girls, boys, and infants and, um, and adolescents in having uh, legal identity. And I'll walk you very briefly through Mexico's um, experience and consular IDs. Our, our consular network uh, dates to uh, when uh, in 8 to 18, 24, uh, with our first consulate in New Orleans, since we had this uh, uh, ship route from Veracruz to New Orleans. And in 1871, we started issuing our first um, sort of uh, consular IDs. Um, uh, a few years passed until the Vienna Convention in 1963, where um, consular uh, relations were uh, regulated uh, between countries and and then followed the uh, uh, the unfortunate attacks of 9-11 which made it necessary for our uh, Mexican nationals to have uh, a, a more reliable source of identification in the U.S. and uh, following this uh, in 2002 Mexican government started issuing uh, consular IDs of high security Matricula Consular de Alta Seguridad in all our uh, 51 consulates in the U.S. This includes our embassy in Washington and 50 consulates mainly distributed in the uh, south border of the U.S., uh, Texas and California. Um, we also issue, currently issue consular IDs in Spain and Costa Rica um, as a means of identification. And uh, in 2006, we uh, started uh, improving the security measures. So we started uh, including biometrics uh, that includes of uh, 10 fingerprints 
and uh, a barcode. And then in 2014, we developed uh, a new uh, ID that was called uh, second generation call center ID, which improved the already um, tight and security measures. And we included an electronic chip um, that is able to be read uh, contactless. And uh, we started uh, printing in PET uh, IDs as well as um, uh, including uh, a more sophisticated design with microtext that makes it uh, more difficult to be reproduced. Uh, so, so why why is this relevant? Well, um, consular ID is a document that recognizes legal identity for uh, Mexican nationals living abroad, as I said, regardless of their uh, migratory status. And this is not exclusively for undocumented uh, migrants, but of course, this is of extreme uh, usefulness for people living uh, without documents abroad. And I would like to highlight four uh, benefits. And it, it is that um, it, it uh, requires less, less requirements than... Uh, Existen menos requisitos que una contraseña, es más económico. La matrícula consular en un plazo de cinco años cuesta 36 dólares en lugar que un pasaporte que cuesta sobre los 100 dólares y también certifica la dirección And uh, for us, it, co um, it covers uh, census um, um, purposes as well as consular protection. And uh, as I've been saying, it's a form of ID, not only uh, before government, uh, local and federal, but also for uh, private institutions. Um, consular IDs are accepted in hospitals, schools, uh, police offices uh, for vaccination, they became relevant in the start of the pandemic. And um, we've been also um, working with banks to ensure they are accepted in Mexico and in the US. Uh, and currently we have 10 states in the US that have a high degree of acceptance of uh, the consular ID. This includes California, Oregon, Washington, Illinois, Minnesota, Connecticut, Maryland, New Mexico, um, Washington DC, and uh, New York. And we have a mixed uh, acceptance in 41 states. And this includes uh, Arizona, which recently joined uh, other states that recognize our consular ID as an official ID. And uh, we're also working uh, with Mexican authorities also, uh, and also private entities to ensure that uh, Mexicans living abroad, when they, when they visit Mexico, they are able to use that ID without having to um, go through the process of, of obtaining a different ID in Mexico. So uh, finally, some really quick figures. Um, we currently uh, have, as of December 2021, around 3 million and a half consular IDs that are uh, currently valid. Uh, And during 2021, we issued uh, 700,000 consular IDs um, only in the US. This represents 24 of uh, documents issued in our uh, consular network. Um, just an interesting figure, um, 57% of the people that have a consular ID are men and 41% are women and uh, only one and a half percent are minors. And our consulates that issue the most consular IDs are uh, Chicago, then Dallas, LA, New York, and Houston. And then finally, uh, the way forward is um, in, in June 2022, we're launching our third generation consular ID that will have um, some uh, security uh, benefits. It will be printed in a polycarbonate card. That is the one that most... Um, e-passports used currently. Uh, it will be printed in the, with laser technique that makes it uh, virtually impossible to be reproduced without authorization. It will have an invisible microchip embedded in the document 
and it will have uh, holograms and uh, UV uh, reactive features. And it will also be, uh, be inclusive because um, it will include the option of uh, not revealing sex or gender or uh, marking an X in the gender or sex um, space for, for people that identify as a non-binary or gender non-conforming. And uh, it will be issued in any uh, consulate regardless of the address of the person that requests it. Currently, you can only obtain a consular ID and uh, your consulate uh, of address. This is if you live in LA, you need to, um, to get your uh, consular ID in, in the LA consulate. But uh, we're gonna change that so, so it's more flexible since we have a, a unified database. And it will also include some uh, features that are uh, included in, uh, in California and other um, licenses, driving licenses, to make it easier for people to obtain such documents, such, such as height, weight, uh, eye color, and hair color. And uh, finally, uh, we will uh, print uh, minors, uh, parents, or tutors, or um, in the back of ID, as a means of fighting um, human and child trafficking, which is uh, something that um, highly concerns Mexico. So this is a, a very quick uh, overview. I hope I, I didn't uh, go too fast, but uh, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions and especially um, eager to, to hear about our, uh, my fellow panelists who have to say about um, their strategies so thank you again, uh, Director General, for this invitation. Uh, and thank you for considering Mexico as, um, as a, a country that is um, uh, putting the fight and advocating for legal identity. So uh, very pleased to be here again. Um, thank you very much, Jaime. As, as you rightly said, um, these constant, uh, how legal identity is an enabler of human rights and how with these consular IDs, that have been issued, one, that they've been issued regardless of legal status and how it has increased access to a whole range of services. Um, and I particularly noted with regard to, to vaccination. So there's also a social protection element as well. So depending on how the time goes, we'll see, hopefully we'll, we can take questions um, at the end. So, so thank you very much again. And now, Mr. Tamas, I welcome you again to this discussion. And you've been working intensely on this topic in preparation for the IMRF, including as chair, as, including as chairing a committee on the Global Forum and for Migration and Development and Global Compact for Migration Relations. And we're really keen to learn about Sweden's experience in implementing GCM Ob Objective 4 to establish proof of legal identity as a policy priority. So a few questions here. Um, first, what is needed to achieve non-discriminatory access for all, including migrants of all status, legal status, geographic access, language barriers, proceedings required, financial barriers, et cetera, and what is needed to ensure that legal identity systems are rights compliant and that legal identities are not used unlawfully are not used to unlawfully discriminate at um, at the border entries and admissions then what are the key operational and technical capacities which are useful for countries seeking to improve access to their civil registry systems and the issuance of identity documents, in particular regarding information and communications technology solutions with robust data protection measures. We heard some of this in the previous presentation. And what specific obstacles may prevent the inclusion of migrants in programs to increase their access to legal identity and documentation at their countries of destination? Um, Mr. Tamas, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Director General Ms. Daniels. And uh, thank you for giving an opportunity uh, for a presentation on behalf of Sweden. Uh, my starting point 
is that it is a fundamental human right to be recognized as a legal person before the law. Sustainable Development Goal 16.8 on legal identity for all, including free birth registration by 2030, is included in the 2030 Agenda and the commitments to leave no one behind. Proof of legal identity is a key requirement for accessing basic services and essential rights. This is also why states have committed within the Global Compact for Migration, Objective 4, to provide all their citizens with proof of nationality and civil registry documents, such as birth, marriage and death certificates. This should be available for migrants upon entry, stay and return. For migrants, lacking proof of legal identity increases the risks of unsafe, irregular and disorderly migration. It plays into the hands of human traffickers and criminal smuggling networks. They increasingly sell authentic travel documents under false pretense. They use fake birth or marriage certificates to obtain genuine documents or using authentic documents of lookalikes. Lack of legal documents makes it more difficult for migrants to reunite with family abroad and to return to their country of origin. It presents an additional threat to migrants caught up in crisis and disasters, as they may find it harder to access critical services, including international evacuation assistance. From a Swedish perspective, we appreciate the work of the UN Legal Identity Agenda Task Force. Also, IOM is working to assist states in the assessment and improvement of identity documents, especially travel documents. There is a worldwide need since 1 billion people are estimated to lack proper access to legal identity. IOM is helping governments with the issuance of documents and management systems with a focus on well-functioning and internationally compliant processes. There is a need in several developing countries to improve national civil registration. The current Swedish government intends to redouble its efforts to counteract the emergence of a parallel shadow society that feeds both segregation and crime. This includes a new panel provision on human exploitation and measures against irregularities and crime in the labor market and employment of people without work permits. The Swedish police has recently been given increased powers in regard of international migration of internal migration control. This means that the police now can take photographs and fingerprints during internal aliens checks. A lack of controls of legal identity could also threaten public safety and be exploited by, for example, potential terrorists. Measures are also on the way to improve the Swedish population register to get a better grasp on people who reside in Sweden. Everyone who lives in Sweden is registered and issued with a personal identity number which is in contact, uh, which uh, is used in contacts with government agencies, banks, hospitals, etc. The Swedish tax agency has recently received more funding to be able to detect, investigate and remedy errors in the population register. For example, it can now deregister false identities and make home visits to check a person's residence. As a European Union member state, Sweden supports joint EU efforts to improve information about third country nationals crossing external borders. That is why we are now adapting Swedish law to the EU's new entry and exit system. It was considered a deficiency in early years that no data were available on people leaving the EU. In addition, the EU has a more general objective to fully digitalize legal identity through the so-called EID and 
authentication services. Regarding asylum seekers as well, the lack of passports has for a long time been a predominant issue. Last year, for example, 85% on average were lacking passports when filing an asylum application in Sweden. For several countries of origin, none of the asylum seekers could show passports. In some cases, uh, passports and ID documents are found later on. So all these uh, issues require measures domestically as well as through international cooperation. Uh, now let me just give you three concrete examples of what the Swedish government has been doing. First, uh, the asylum seeker card. Uh, Sweden has for a long time been using specific asylum seeker plastic cards with the photo as a proof that the individuals are asylum seekers. This is not equivalent to an ID card. However, it facilitates life in Sweden for the asylum seekers. The card also contains information whether the asylum seeker has the right to work. The card is uh, helpful when contacting various uh, authorities and employers and when opening bank accounts. Asylum seekers also have the right to reduced fees when showing the card at the pharmacy. Uh, the 1st of January this year, the Swedish Migration Agency introduced a new form of the card, which also contains digital information, digitally updated uh, with a QR code. Uh, second, uh, the second example is the right to health care for asylum seekers and undocumented migrants. This is available since 2013, uh, as uh, undocumented foreign-born persons have a legal right to subsidized care to the same extent as asylum seekers. This right covers people who stay more than just temporarily in Sweden without a permit. It also includes uh, those who abscond from the execution of deportation orders. Um, these individuals may have special health, health needs, though. Uh, they may have poorer access to health care due to a lack of legal identity, and it may also be more difficult to gain knowledge about the health situation in these groups. Uh, the right for migrants, regardless of their legal status, covers necessary care or care that cannot wait without it having serious consequences for the patient. This could, for example, be emergency care and care according to the Infection Control Act. Uh, it also includes maternal health care, uh, care in the event of an abortion and contraceptive counseling. Asylum seeking children and undocumented children under the age of 18 are in addition entitled to the same health and dental care as people who are permanent residents of the country. My third and final example is about the right to schooling for undocumented children. This is also in place since 2013. Um, these children have the right to education in preschool classes, primary school, special primary school, and special schools. If they start their education before they have turned 18, they also have the right to go to upper secondary school and upper secondary uh, continuing uh, their education. Uh, neither schools nor the Social Welfare Board have any obligation to notify the police authority regarding undocumented families. In order to safeguard the anonymity of undocumented families, the school may decide to keep information about the student confidential. However, such a decision may also be revoked if it's appealed to court. So these are my examples. Uh, thank you very much uh, for listening, and I'm looking forward to take questions and uh, to hear your comments. Thanks. Thank you very much, Christoph. There, there are some parallels um, with Jaime's presentation, and obviously you, you started by framing this within the context of human rights and the right to legal identity. 
You also talked about um, digitalizing legal identity as well as the links to social, social protection, um, healthcare and schooling. Um, so yes, very much in, in, uh, similar to the uh, previous, to the Mexican experience, but you also highlighted this issue of the parallel shadow society um, and the, uh, the, the environment this creates for exploitation crimes and a whole range of, of human rights um, violations. So thank you, thank you very much. And now finally, um, my last speaker, last but not the least, um, Mr. McCann, glad to have UNDP's perspective after this discussion and two um, national examples uh, where we've heard uh, their best practices as well as challenges. So I'd like to invite you to share with us UNDP's work to support legal identity for all and your recommendations on how to leverage partnerships through the UN Task Force on Legal Identity, how to improve registration systems, including civil registries, and access to documentation systems to ensure their rights compliant. We've heard a lot about rights today, which is, which is really important. That's what this discussion is grounded on. Um, to ensure their rights compliant to address the legal identity commitment found in the SDGs and in the Global Compact on Migration. Um, Mr. McCann, you have the floor. Deputy Director General Ugachi, thank you so much. Uh, greetings also to my previous, our fellow panelists and to everybody um, logging in. Uh, UNDP is delighted to be partnering not only with IOM, but with, as you mentioned at the start, a number of other uh, UN agencies active in the field of population registration. Um, since 2018, we have a united UN position on the issue of legal identity, which broadly states that not only should everyone on the planet um, have the means to prove who they are, but that member states should implement systems that allow people to be able to have a holistic um, coverage of legal identity from birth to death. And what that means basically in practicality is that obviously uh, universal birth registration is the gold standard of legal identity, but in cases where people for whatever reason are not able to produce a birth certificate as they move forward uh, during life, um, uh, states may decide and have indeed decided for many years now to roll out additional forms of identity management systems, such as national ID card schemes, national population registers, or increasingly fully digital ID schemes. And wherever member states do this, those systems should be linked with the core civil registration system of birth and death registration. This is for a number of very, very practical reasons, one of which is that if you do not have any means to identify a teenager entering an adult national ID card scheme, national population register, when that teenager turns either 14 or 16 or 18, whenever the member state is issuing those documents. Well, if the teenager cannot identify themselves via a birth certificate, how do you identify that teenager entering the system? And if we are relying on things then like uh, witnessing uh, promises by local community leaders, etc., that this teenager is who the teenager says he or she is, that can be open to political manipulation, um, et cetera, in some countries, uh, and it can be very, very problematic. Equally, at the other set end of the life cycle, if you do not link death registration with various forms of national ID systems, well, then your database day after day is full of dead people. And then there's a, a problem of the overall confidence that the public has in the integrity of the identity management system. So that's the position of the UN, universal birth registration. And if you have then any form of national population register, national ID card scheme, link both of those uh, schemes uh, together. Um, we are delighted to say that we do not have any policy disagreements, it appears, between any of the UN agencies in this arena, which is quite remarkable. And indeed, when it comes specifically to migrants and also to refugees and displaced persons, 
for example, we were delighted that UNHCR's position is, of course, that for refugees um, in host countries that have accepted them and, and where UNHCR has registered them as refugees, member states, the government of the host country should include those refugees in their national identity management systems, regardless of the issue of citizenship or nationality. So refugees should have access to birth registration, civil registration, death registration for any life events that occur on uh, the territory of a host uh, a government. And UNDP, and I believe the IOM, is happy to support that position as well. There are a couple of specific areas where I think the world can do better with regards to migrants, and in particular, with regards to migrants in vulnerable uh, uh, situations. As we all know, there are many, many migrants that end up in a foreign country, and for whatever reason, do not any longer have access to any form of identity documents. This can be because they've just been lost, or of course, as we are all aware, uh, identity documents can get either stolen or indeed confiscated by employers or, or others manipulating the status of irregular and vulnerable uh, migrants. And when those situations occur, and in particular in countries where migrants do not have any consular um, representation, then there must be a way for migrants to be able to access and download digital versions of identity documents that will be recognized by the host country. And if we consider that all 193 member states of the United Nations have got together, and indeed additional uh, non-recognized countries have got together under the auspices of the International Civil Aviation Organization. And we have agreed collectively as a world what technical standards for passports um, are. They are now universally standardized across the world. If it's that possible to standardize plastic and paper travel documents, why is it not possible to standardize and agree what digital documents would look like in a manner that all member states of the UN um, could recognize. Um, that could be an incredibly empowering thing for a migrant in a foreign country in a vulnerable situation where they've lost access to their identity documents. So not only should we be working towards the possibility for migrants or indeed anybody to be able to remotely access um, digital versions of their own documents from a foreign country, that there should be an international agreement that has foreign, uh, all countries accept that they will facilitate and agree procedures to allow migrants to be able to access uh, those types of uh, uh, documents. There was mention earlier by my two panelists about biometric uh, registration um, also. We do desperately need at the global level some form of standards now on the use of biometric technology, not just um, in the counter-terrorism field, which at the moment within the United Nations is pretty much the only area where there is an agreement on the use of biometric technology, including invasive biometric technology, such as facial recognition systems. We need to be able to expand and set standards for the use of these types of technologies within public administration in general, and indeed in the travel and migration uh, uh, context. I don't think many migrants, many travelers are too happy, for example, about the idea, well, that in order to enter countries or be registered in foreign countries, that facial recognition data um, is taken from them in a manner where they do not know how that data is being used, how it is being shared, how is it going to be uh, 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 deployed. And in particular, we have to be realistic. With the increasing advent of use of CCTV cameras and use of facial recognition systems, I don't think there has been enough global policy discussion about discrimination of migrants and foreigners when using that type of technology and an impact or, or, or the extent of surveillance on particularly vulnerable migrants uh, in foreign contexts. We need to expand that discussion uh, further. Equally, we also have to work stronger on the issue of standardization of uh, identity documents below the level of passports. 
IOM and UNDP have just finalized a publication on the creation of free movement zones, um, including a lot of very, very practical advice on how countries may come together in economic communities um, and agree the standards international standards on things like national ID cards that will that would allow those documents to be used as proof of legal identity in a, in a migration and a foreign travel uh, context. That should be expanded uh, uh, further. We are here to advise any countries that want to help go down that path. And um, those of us that, that do live in, in the European Union or in the Schengen area, uh, are very aware of the ease with which people can travel across borders using only national ID uh, uh, cards uh, instead of passports. And we, were, we are available to expand support to any regional economic communities around the world that would like to develop similar systems. But also, even below the level of national ID cards, there's a lot of work to do, I feel, on general standardization of documents, including birth certificates or death certificates. I happen to live in a country, uh, Belgium at the moment, for example, where a German citizen coming to Belgium, even where German is an official language in Belgium, still has to get a birth certificate translated officially by a court appointed translator into French or into Dutch in order for that certificate to be recognized uh, at the national uh, or at the local municipality. That seems like a crazy situation um, uh, for, for people from that country uh, to be in. So why can we not come together, not just in this part of the world in Europe, but all over uh, parts of the world, including in Africa or in Latin America, etc., and have countries agree on the technical standards for things like birth certificates that will allow them to be used as proof of legal identity in foreign countries without the need for crazy translations um, etc. I know there's a problem with use of uh, uh, alphabets that are non-Latin, uh, um, etc. But it, this does not seem to be an insurmountable um, uh, obstacle. We have done it for passports. Why can we not do it for birth certificates, for marriage certificates, etc. In a manner that will allow people somehow be able to access and use those documents to prove who they are, even if they are not in possession of a passport or indeed a national ID card. So these are some of the, the things we can do. There's probably more and I look forward to the uh, future discussions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nell. You've, it seems your key message is standardization, 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 um, be it of birth certificates, death certificates, um, uh, national uh, identity documents as well, but also highlighting the areas where we need to expand to enable, for instance, free movement zones, um, as well as the use of biometric technology is potential for discrimination and more work um, there as well. I'm very, very conscious of time, so I won't be able to do any more justice to what was a really, really interesting um, presentation. So I'm quickly going to move to Dan, my colleague Dan, because I understand that we have some requests um, for the floor. So Thank you. Dan, Thank you. over to you. Thank you, DDG. At this moment, we have a free request from the floor. First one coming from Sri Lanka. His Excellency Mohan P Pieris, Permanent Representative of Sri Lanka in UN New York, followed by Representative of Colombia, followed by Representative of Uruguay. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the floor this morning. Uh, my delegation would like to thank the panel for the insights provided during the discussion. I thought they were very insightful and perhaps the last idea of standardization was very attractive. We are all agreed that legal identity is at the heart of combating regular migration. Uh, and in promoting regular migration, which contributes to the prosperity and development of both the sending state and the receiving state. Sri Lanka, as you know, has taken a number of measures to realize objective four of the GCM and ensure that all migrants have legal identity and adequate documentation. Now these include, in addition to law enforcement measures uh, against illegal migration, the creation of an enabling environment to obtain legal identity such as passports and building the capacity of our foreign diplomatic missions especially in countries where significant numbers of Sri Lankan migrants, uh, labor migrants reside. So consular support is provided in obtaining legal identity, 
where such identity has been lost or misplaced. Now, in order to enhance migrant worker protection, standard employment contracts for departing migrant workers is a mandatory requirement for registering them with the Sri Lanka Bureau of Foreign Employment. Educating migrant workers about the terms and conditions of a standard contract is conducted at the pre-departure orientation by the Bureau. The registration at the Bureau assists in maintaining records on those who seek employment overseas and the grievance resolution process, provides easy access through a passport number or a national card, identity card number to information related to the employers or their family members. Recently, an amnesty period was declared by the Foreign Employment Bureau for Sri Lankans currently working overseas who have migrated for employment through different channels without registration to register through the missions or the post outside. The purpose of this was to ensure their welfare and protection while bringing them into the system. Our diplomatic missions in labor receiving countries assist in renewing passports and registering births and marriage certificates overseas. For those who don't have a passport, identity is verified and a temporary passport is issued during repatriation. A mechanism is already in place to issue death certificates upon receiving reports of deaths that have occurred overseas to family members in Sri Lanka through the relevant channels. And finally, legal identity is also crucial in facilitating the regular processes in sending remittances as those legal uh, without legal identity are prone to using illegal money transfer mechanisms. In the wake of COVID-19, Sri Lanka also launched a dedicated vaccination program for prospective immigrant workers to ensure they are fully vaccinated prior to departure. The government also recognized prospective immigrant workers as an eligible category to receive the popularly preferred Pfizer booster uh, in order to meet the requirements uh, of some host countries. Uh, the success of Sri Lanka's vaccination drive for migrant workers, uh, I must inform the panel, was facilitated by the existence of a legal identity facilitating legal regular migration. My delegation would like to share these thoughts with, with the forum in the spirit of sharing best practices aimed at addressing the issues of legal identity for migration and be assured that we will, we will comply and cooperate with uh, the international regime at all times. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Excellency. Uh, second on our list is a representative of Colombia, Juan Francisco Espinoza, Director of the Mig Migration. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm going to switch to Spanish. Buenos dias. Good morning. As you all know, since 2015, due to the weakening of the political and humanitarian conditions and the hyperinflation in Venezuela, we've had a deep economic crisis, which had caused a massive outflow of those who want to flee from the regime and the security and the threats in that country. Colombia is actually hosting a little bit over a million, uh, 480 thousand uh, Venezuelans for August in 2021. We found 18% of them in the regular migration condition, 17% of them in irregular migration condition, and 64% in the process to access the regularization mechanism designed by the Colombian government called temporary condition of protection for Venezuelan migrants. This tool is implemented by the Colombian Migration Department and it is formulated as a mechanism inspired in the strict respect for human rights to offer protection to the essential human rights to create regularization processes of the migrants, taking into account their needs, allowing them to be incorporated to the economic um, fabric of the country and to have access to a, vi a visa, which will last for 10 years. This mechanism enables us to have a comprehensive analysis of the migrant population, which will allow us to formulate integration public policies focused on generating well-being for the migrants and their families as well as their adaptation to the hosting communities. Also, it allows the Venezuelan migrants to work in our territory in the same conditions as a Colombian citizen. They can also access to the institutional, to the public and private uh, labor offered, um, having the rights protected. 
and also enabling the full incorporation into our country. One of the key elements for the regular migration has to do with identification and the formal documentation of migrants, uh, apart from the importance of including strategies which can of allow to give also an answer to the protection of the fundamental rights, which will also disencourage irregular migration in a non-discriminatory way. The irregularity implies, without any doubt, an impact on the contribution of the migrants into the economy, as, for example, the remittances and also the tax payments they make. However, not to know who is here in our country represents a risk in terms of collective safety. And it is therefore a great barrier, a great hurdle to include everybody in order to legislate and to formulate social economic um, policies. And not to regularize migration also increases the difficulty of uh, bringing criminals uh, to justice and also it makes it difficult to prevent crimes. In order to do all that, in order to tackle this topic of uh, legal um, identity, this institute allows the migrant from Venezuela to be inscribed in Colombia through a unique and exclusive uh, Venezuelan migrant registration where they have free access to this registry. After that, the uh, petitioners, they should also fill out a socioeconomic questionnaire and that will allow the Colombian government to understand really all the situation these migrants from Venezuela face and this will also help us to facilitate their incorporation and the inclusion uh, process and then in the second phase of this process they have to come face to face it is an interview we also here in this stage two of the process the migrants will go through a biometric uh, process and then they are given a document which is called the temporal permit which allows the Venezuelan migrants to stay in Colombia in a special migration regulatory process until 10 years to build a better present and future. The issuance of this permit means the reestablishment of the dignity of the migrant with the plastic high quality document which is formalizing the rights and duties of these Venezuelan migrants here in Colombia. In this process Obviously, this has allowed us to identify some implementation challenges like the, um, obviously, the budget development, the strengthening of the capacity and institutional uh, coordination problems like, for example, the um, migrant smuggling and trafficking and xenophobia. But we have received the international support which has allowed us to complement the actions carried out by the government and to create synergies among the different actors to move forward in an efficient way to develop policies which will safeguard the human rights and to lead efforts to mobilize a coordinated response in the benefit of migrants and the host territories. This is why uh, we would like to highlight uh, what we are doing today here, I mean, to look for alternative solutions to answer the challenges of the migration process and also to favor the exchange of ideas and approaches of development to generate the strengthening of international consultations and to look for common agreements. This is the document I was telling you about. This is what we give to the Venezuelan uh, migrants. It's a very uh, solid, high quality document. Here in Colombia we are proud of our uh, fraternal migration policy which protects people and allows us to dream a better present and future for all of us. We will always be willing to share experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, we still have actually five uh, countries that ask for interventions, and I would like to ask all to be brief as possible. We also need to go come back to the panelists and ask for their final words. Uh, next on our list is Uruguay. Uh, First Secretary of the Permanent Representative, Juan Riva. Thank you. And thank you also to, the, to Mrs. Deputy Director General for, for this opportunity. I also like to thank all the panelists for their very interesting insights and remarks on this matter today. And if you allow me, I will deliver this intervention in Spanish. Uruguay supports the, the Global Compact, which we believe is especially relevant and fundamental to have a basic 
document supported by the international community, which allows us to talk about on the same language when it comes to legal identity. So we would like to also thank you um, uh, the, for the support of the IOM in the whole of during this process, and specifically in this context of the health emergency. With regards to objective four of the global compact, which is to to ensure that all migrants have proof of legal identity and adequate do documentation. I'd like to mention that the basis of the mi migra migration policy in Uruguay is to regularize migrants. We think that their contribution, which is very positive, starts with regularizing their situation. Having the relevant documentation allows the migrant to work, study, trade, access uh, health services, housing, and also to have the freedom to to, uh, to be involved uh, within the legal framework of the country and also to be able to provide its contribution to the society. The migrant allows, accesses the processing of the identity document as soon as they start their residency. This allows them access to having services at the same, uh, in the same conditions as other nationals this is also related with the compliance of other objectives of the Global Compact, such as Objective 6, which is to facilitate fair and ethical recruitment and safeguard conditions, or also to provide the migrant access to basic services. We highlight in this last point that in Uruguay, migrants have access to basic services and on the same conditions as other nationals, with uh, the effect of having a, an identity card on the same basis as Uruguayans. So for Uruguay to implement objective four is, an, is essential because providing documentation to the migrant is the starting point, allowing them to integrate in the society and allowing with the implementation of objective four, allowing the implementation, the implementation of the other objectives such as two, three, four, and et cetera, uh, to increase uh, regular points of accesses and not criminalizing it, uh, simplifying processes allows the state to have a reasonable view of the migrant population. And we can then create public policy with, with real information with these migrants when they are already, already in our territory in a regular way the information will be complete regularizing migrants also has another important issue with regards to security it doesn't just allow us to have the relevant registration but also makes migrants less vulnerable um, before um, criminal gangs and on this line consular services in Uruguay need to have the relevant tools in order to provide the relevant documents for those based in other countries and allowing them to regularize their own status abroad in order for them to access their rights. The strategy of regularizing migrants in Uruguay has been recognized by international, international organizations on this subject, such as the IOM. And regardless of that, we do recognize the challenges involved in complex situations such as the current one. Uruguay commits itself to carry on, on working on the multilateralism and international cooperation, both at regional and world level. So in order to reduce irregular migration and to fight against smuggling and trafficking and other kinds of exploitation, and also to provide better consular assistance for migrants throughout their process. Uh, Mrs. President, we are at your disposal to share our experiences and to try to be the best partner we can be in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Uruguay. As we still have uh, four representatives to, to that ask for intervention, we'll ask each of them to be in one minute if possible. Very short intervention, please, or we need to come back to the panelists. Next one in line is Chad. Representative Chad, please go ahead. Do we have each other line? Yes, but not unmuting. Now, now he's turning on this camera. Yeah. 
Eh bien, merci de m'avoir donné la parole et merci aussi de l'invitation. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for giving me the floor. First and foremost, I would like to share something with you, um, an experience, more specifically about ID and documentation. They are the very basis of the legal identity of our citizens. And I would like to talk about the law of, uh, on ID documents in Chad, which aims at being a universal law for everyone, for all citizens in uh, the territory of Chad. For children, children of migrants who were born on our territory and they are automatically registered in the database of birth and death. And it's free. Registration is free. It's the main principle of this law. Everything is free. In the last few years, we created a, a national office for uh, safe and secured uh, ID documentations. We decided to grant a specific number, ID number, for everyone living in the country. And we also have the possibility to to give like uh, travel cards and travel documents. So the migrants, and when we're talking about refugees, so we have a lot of refugees coming from various countries in Chad. And so we had a project So in this, in this project, we uh, had the support of the, the uh, United Nations Agency for Refugees. And and this project was called the project to, to support citizenship and, and fight statelessness. And so, in thanks to this project in our refugee camps, we've been able to give uh, ID documents and birth certificates. And also death certificates. So we wanted to make sure that people, uh, to make sure that they had, everyone had a death certificate. So the Ministry of Security and Safety uh, in charge of uh, migrations. I've been able, thanks to the consular services, we've been able to give uh, permits, resident permits and many kind of documents for refugees. And we're here for that. Everything runs smoothly in the facilitation of the, the charge and government is in the right line with the global compact for migrations. So today, as we speak, Chad is complying with this convention for migrations. And we're adapting our laws to cope with the current situation and to, to fight uh, smuggling and human trafficking. And we, we aim at guaranteeing the rights of migrants and their families thanks to uh, a bill that may will soon be voted. I would not want to sp spend, take too much of your time, but these were a few examples I wanted to highlight for you and to say that Chide is working hard and we are 
working on this. I would like to thank you very much and looking forward to talking with you again. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you to Chad, but unfortunately, concerning the rest, we still have the, the, the basically more uh, Venezuela, Gwen, and Portugal, and, and unfortunately, we already run out of the time. I'd like to return back to the panelists for a concluding remarks, and we'd like to hand over the floor to Monica Goraccia, our DMM director, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dan, and uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon to everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be able to uh, be with you in this, in this concluding, uh, concluding um, moment of this very important uh, panel. And I would like to ask our panelists for a last, uh, maybe a couple of words um, on legal identity, especially as we gear up towards IMRF. If you think about what you hear heard today and your perspectives, what are your wishes for the IMRF? And I would like to start with uh, uh, Jaime Vasquez Bracho. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, one important aspect that has been highlighted uh, during the panel has been digital access to legal identity. And that is something uh, we could all work on, but not only digital access, but also a mutual recognition of digital uh, IDs and, um, and means of um, identification. So I, I think that is uh, something that uh, we can work uh, on with, with the help of uh, UN migration and um, uh, IOM. So I would just like to leave it there. and. Uh, say that we are currently working on uh, sophisticating our uh, um, digitalization processes to be able to uh, not only uh, access, uh, not only renew our uh, consular IDs, but also to, to have uh, some sort of uh, electronic access to them. So I would leave it there and, and thank again uh, IOM for the opportunity to um, share our experience and issuing consular IDs. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Bracho. I, I think, yes, digital uh, solutions are definitely very important. And, uh, and especially now, what we've seen in the past couple of years, we've been relying so much on digital, on our digital uh, communication and, and work. So this is something that we'll certainly take away. Um, Mr. Thomas? Uh, thank wishes? you. Yes, uh, I would like to refer to what uh, Mr. McCann, UNDP, said about uh, documents below the level of passport or ID cards, uh, because this is also important uh, in order to counteract the shadow society. In Sweden, one example of this is the so-called coordination number. This is used for individuals who are not formally registered in Sweden. And the purpose of the coordination number is to meet the authorities' need for clear and uniform identity for those persons. A coordination number does not in itself confer any rights or benefits, uh, thanks to recent legislation in order to reduce the risk of misuse, uh, the Swedish tax agency has been able to suspend a large number of obsolete coordination numbers uh, to ensure that everybody in the country has a le legal identity. Uh, for the IMRF, I would like to refer to discussions within the Global Forum on Migration and Development. The GFMD identified three major types of challenges. Uh, first, the lack of documentation as a basis to prove legal identity. Second, migrants who deliberately move without documentation. And third, the difficulties of effectively advising migrants on their rights, obligations, and methods of seeking support. So the final uh, conclusion is that the international cooperation should assist uh, migrant source countries to ensure broader delivery of authentic birth certificates, ID cards, and travel documents. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Thomas. These are very important points, and uh, both in terms of the work that we need to do on capacity development, but also addressing the 
shadow, uh, which is the shadow world that many migrants are in, which is something that affects many different areas of migration. And that is so important also to combat irregular migrations. So these are, are very uh, important points. And so I would like to go to my colleague from UNDP, Mr. McCann, for your wishes for the MRF before we conclude this panel. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Monica. Um, uh, wonderful examples from Mexico, Sweden, Colombia, Uruguay, Chad. Um, uh, please remember as well, a point I didn't get to mention earlier, with the, the world, we need to do more policy work on the issue of identity documents issued by non-state armed groups, uh, an incredibly complex uh, issue. No baby, no child born um, in a territory under uh, the administration of a non-recognized armed group should suffer from the lack of, of legal identity because we don't recognize the authority of the armed group issuing documents. Um, and that's a, a challenge a lot of member states are having at the moment, and we need more international agreement on this. Let's not also forget global migration is going to accelerate. It's not going to decelerate. Um, temporary migration is going to accelerate and not decelerate. We are not speaking just of uh, workers like agricultural workers, seasonal agricultural workers moving forward. We are going to see post-pandemic an explosion in the number of so-called digital nomads traveling um, around the world. And that raises very, very complex questions around taxation, for example. If you are living in one country, but officially working in another country, well, then which government gets to tax you for, for living but, but, but uh, uh, with economic activity conducted in a different jurisdiction. And what I think we're likely to see in coming years to, to uh, uh, deal with that challenge is an increase in data sharing across borders between governments as they try to figure out who is this person that is coming and going for months at a time but doesn't appear to be working here, uh, et cetera? They're a, they're a national of your country. How are we going to tax this person, et cetera? Increased data sharing for things like taxation creates uh, an enormous responsibility on countries to at least have agreed standards around what identity documents that person is presenting to both uh, the jurisdictions. So again, this is another reason why I think we need to work a lot on the standardization of identity documents um, moving forward. And finally, any member state that wants to work with us, be it, be it IOM, be it UNDP, we are all working together now, UNHCR, the World Food Programme, the World Health Organization, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, UN Women, the Population Fund, we're all together in this legal identity agenda task force, not competing with each other. So please, any of the representatives we have heard today, any other member states that wants to work with this on both the policy side, but also helping practically roll out of legal identity initiatives at national level, including for vulnerable migrants and indeed refugees, please get in touch with us. And thanks to our IOM colleagues for today's event. Thank you very much, uh, Niall, for this and for highlighting this joint one UN approach that is really uh, exemplary in, in this field and also for raising the issue of of, uh, of, of these uh, uh, digital move that, let, that goes also into the future of work, right? Because there will be, you know, with, with this virtual work going on, that will also raise a lot of issues and questions on what type of documentation uh, one needs to have, what type of rights uh, if you work for a country, but you're not in that country. And so these are really very important points. So thank you very much to the panelists. Thank you all. Um, for participating and apologies if we could not take all the requests for, for the floor. It has been a very interesting discussion from IOM's role uh, within the UN network on migration. It is very important for me to highlight here that legal identity is one of our institutional priorities for the upcoming IMRF. We want an IMRF, and I think I speak on behalf of all of you uh, who have been with us today with a strong progress declaration, which includes a resolute direction from states about the road ahead to attain the GCM objective on legal identity for people on the move. And in fact, while the IDM is separate from the uh, IMRF process, 
our discussions here today will be really feeding into the preparations of the forum. So beyond this IDM, as stakeholders gear up towards the MRF, I want to take this chance to encourage reflections and uh, policy deliberations around pledges that can bridge the gap for migrants without proof of legal identity. So as we gear towards uh, IMRF, let us think about what are the commitments that will enable us to effectively address the issues that we discussed today? And how can we come up with the concrete proposals that can get us to a forward-looking and attainable IMRF progress declaration, which will bring us into the next cycle of GCM implementation? So let's work towards IMRF, but think beyond IMRF. So with this, I would like to thank you very much again on behalf of the Deputy Director General and uh, my colleagues, and uh, I give back the floor to you, Dan. Thank you a lot, Monica, and I'd like you one more time to thank you to all panelists and De Deputy Director General and, and to you, Monica, for moderating this excellent panel one on the day two. Uh, also, would like to invite one more time Venezuela, Guyana, Portugal, and Sudan that didn't have a chance actually to give their intervention to this panel to send us in writing their intervention and we'll be glad to include them in our report. Uh, now we are transiting to the panel two for uh, today of what is uh, with the title Enhancing Protectability and Addressing Inequalities for the Future of Human Mobility in Pandemic Era. And uh, with this, I would like to give the floor to the next moderator, uh, what is the, the, the Megan Benton, uh, Director of, of Research, MPI International Program, MPI Europe. Megan, floor is yours. Thank you, Diane, and thank you very much, everyone. Uh, welcome, Excellencies, distinguished guests, participants, panelists, and friends. Uh, welcome to this panel on enhancing predictability and addressing inequalities for the future of human mobility in the pandemic era. Um, as Diane said, I'm the research director for the Migration Policy Institute's international work. I also lead MPI's work on COVID and mobility, which is uh, supporting greater international coordination on border health, migration and mobility. I also co-authored the joint uh, MPI-IOM report on COVID-19 and the state of mobility, which was kindly included in the proposed uh, resources. Uh, so I'm delighted to be moderating this, this panel today, which will consider evolving requirements for travel and admission and their impact on migration and inequality, uh, as well as how the UN system can promote migrant inclusion through pandemic preparedness and response. Uh, I know yesterday we heard about very, very concrete steps to reduce risks and vulnerabilities for people on the move, but uh, today is really an opportunity to think ahead to how we build durable systems that facilitate mobility both, both today and in the future. Um, of course, the pandemic has illustrated just how essential migrants are to their societies and the vital role they play across many economic sectors. Uh, the pandemic casts the often invisible work that migrants do as teachers and agricultural workers and, and care workers and cleaners into, into stark relief. Um, but people on the move were, of course, also disproportionately affected by the harms of the pandemic. They were more susceptible to job losses. They were often more exposed to the virus by virtue of being in frontline occupations. And of course, the millions of migrants left stranded was one of the early, most painful scars of the pandemic. Many of these inequalities have lasted through the second year of the pandemic or have been replaced with new ones that continue to be very troubling today. People on the move often suffer inequities in access to healthcare, in opportunities to social distance, for instance, because of congested housing or working conditions inability to self-isolate and bear the costs of not working. And they were often excluded from social safety nets, from stimulus and social protection uh, packages to unemployment, making them particularly vulnerable to the socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic. Now, these things are wrong in themselves, but they're also counterproductive. They create the conditions for COVID-19 and other pathogens to spread. And of course, vaccination has been one of the great dividing lines of equity in the second year of the pandemic. While some countries have chosen to vaccinate migrants and refugees alongside uh, nationals, uh, in others only those with a regular status are eligible. As of December, out of 180 countries, territories and authorities, 132 included refugees in their vaccine rollouts, 149 included regular migrants and 84 included 
reg irregular migrants too. And this is, of course, against the backdrop of the fact that only 13% of the population of low income countries has been vaccinated. So as many governments and authorities are moving towards vaccination requirements for crossing borders, as well as imposing often costly testing requirements, this is making cross-border movement more costly and unequal. And of course, the big concern here is that rising costs of travel and, and regular migration routes create incentives for disorderly, unsafe and irregular movement or create the fertile ground for smugglers and traffickers to um, exploit. So what we want to discuss today is how to ensure that the process of building back after pandemic and planning for the next pandemic really embeds people on the move at its heart. How can we ensure that requirements for travel and admission um, don't further entrench inequalities in accessing regular migration? How can governments in the UN system strengthen mobility governance, especially as it relates to public health equity concerns and establish a more resilient global mobility system for the future? And how in this age of pandemic, can we keep our eyes on the prize of the GCM objectives and the goals of reducing inequalities as outlined in the 2030 agenda? So I have a terrific panel with me today to help address these questions. Um, His Excellency Ambassador Rongvutu Virabutur is the Ambassador and Deputy Permanent Representative and Charge d'Affaires of Thailand, the United Nations in Geneva. He previously served as the Director of Economic Division at the Department of ASEAN Affairs and Director of the Division of Development Affairs, the Department of International Organizations, and in numerous other diplomatic postings in Europe and Asia. Dr. Nedret Emiroglu is the Director of Country Readiness Strengthening for Health Emergencies at the World Health Organization. Her department is responsible for building core national capacities to mitigate and respond to emerging risks and vulnerabilities, especially as relates to vulnerable and low capacity countries. She's had a long and distinguished career in public health and development and communicable disease prevention, including in the Turkish Ministry of Health and at the WHO Regional Office for Europe. And His Excellency Ambassador David Donoghue is Distinguished Fellow at the Overseas Development Institute. He was Ireland's Ambassador to the United Nations in New York, where he co-chaired three major UN negotiation processes, including the negotiations that led to the Agreement on the Sustainable Development Goals and the wider 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in 2415, and the New York Declaration on Large Movements of Refugees and Migrants in 2016, which led to negotiations on the two global compacts. I want to first turn to Ambassador Verabutur. Uh, could you talk please about how Thailand has promoted safe, healthy and orderly migration in the pandemic response and work to ensure that migrants are included in health systems? Ambassador Verabutur, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator and uh, distinguished panel members, distinguished participants, colleagues. It's my pleasure to be part of today's discussions on a topic relevant to us. I will try to address two questions that are posed by moderator. So based on Thailand's experiences, the key answers are migrant inclusive and corporations, which I shall uh, elaborate more on this. Migrant workforce has been one of the indispensable driver of Thailand economies during the COVID-19 pandemic. Their life has been heavily impacted. Thailand therefore implemented a number of measures to reduce the vulnerability and to ensure safe and healthy condition of migrant workers. We believe that they could serve as example of how to improve the predictability of human mobility in time of crisis. And first, predictability can be increased by creating regular pathway. National efforts could be supplemented by bilateral or regional corporations. Thailand has therefore concluded labor MOU with our neighboring countries as a clear demonstration of regular pathways based on bilateral corporations. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the border lockdown prevented workers return to their homeland. Thailand introduced temporary visas or work permit extension to prevent them from becoming illegal. We also allow for registration of undocumented workers from Cambodia, Laos, PDR, and Myanmar who were staying illegally in the countries. Having migrants on record 
help increase the effectiveness of migrant management and reduce the vulnerability of migrants and improve their protection. Second, the predictability could be enhanced by efforts to increase access to basic services and social security for migrants. Healthy migrants can better contribute to the society they live and help improve public perceptions as well as reduce inequality in the society in line with the Objective 15 of the GCM. Thailand is committed to enhancing access to health services for all, including migrants, to the Universal Health Coverage Policy. Two health coverage schemes are offered to migrants, including the Social Security Scheme for migrant workers in the formal sector and migrant health insurance card available as an option for registered migrant workers in the informal sector, undocumented workers, as well as their dependents, irrespective of their documentation status, at a very affordable cost of around 40 US dollars per, per year. To assist migrants in overcoming practical barriers such as language and lack of information, the government has further formulated the policy to promote migrant friendly health services. Migrant health workers and migrant health volunteers, also the instrumental in providing basic health knowledge and assistance to migrants in their native language. During the COVID-19 pandemic, they had also played an important role in disease prevention and control by, among others, coordinating active screening tests, quarantine and treatment. Our national COVID-19 vaccine rollout plan includes everyone in the countries, including migrants, irrespective of their status. So migrants are also entitled to obtain COVID-19 treatment free of charge. And all this is of efforts and the key that Thailand used to promote safe and healthy migration with increased predictability. So I am looking forward to exchange the view on this matter with you, Madam Moreza. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador. That was a really incredibly rich overview of the very practical and creative ways that Thailand has reduced vulnerabilities and ensured safe and healthy conditions of migrant workers. And I really like this guiding ethos of migrant friendly health services that you spoke about. Um, I want to turn now to Dr. Nedret Amiroglu to talk about the WHO work on equity and inclusion, um, especially as relates to people on the move. What's the role of migration and mobility uh, issues within WHO actions and intergovernmental processes more broadly on pandemic preparedness? Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. And WHO is grateful to IOM for the opportunity to join this discussion and, and on a very relevant topic of addressing inequalities affecting the human mobility, particularly in the pandemic era. For WHO, people's health, particularly the vulnerable populations, of course, which includes the migrants, refugees, as well as the internally displaced populations are of high priority. So what is a matter of principle, leaving no one behind, access to health, I'm not saying only health care or health services. Access to full health, which includes the prevention, health promotion, as well as the older mental and social uh, support, type psychosocial support is included, including for preparedness for health emergencies. And unfortunately, globally, we face probably the highest number of refugees and IDPs and migrants since the Second World War and currently and, and dealing with, a, with a, again another conflict in Ukraine, which is now uh, affecting more than half a million population. And reflecting on the past two years, as we have learned from the pandemic and our response to them, 
we know that the vulnerable populations, particularly the migrants, whatever their, their conditions are, as well as the refugees, can be left out, which increases actually the inequities, particularly if you look at the COVID interventions, either it's the vaccines, as you mentioned, or is it, if whether it is the, the testing, or if whether it is the treatment, as well as all the protective equipment like the mask and, and physical distance and, and all that, because they have to work in crowded conditions, of course, puts them into a lot more higher risk uh, situation, as well as because of their vulnerability. And we have a number of evidence on working together with the countries, some assuring full access, but unfortunately the policies are quite different depending on the country. And as you rightly mentioned, I think the, some of the standardization to pre- protect the most vulnerable in terms of access to health also during the uh, emergencies is a paramount effect. So one of the tools we, we, we uh, have been working in partnership to, to improve access to, which I can give us from the COVID example, is the ACT Accelerator, which is a partnership to improve access of, of particularly low-income countries and the populations in need to the interventions available for COVID. Like if I could give an example for COVAX, which is the vaccine stream of of the accelerator, it is up till now has been donating 1 billion doses to more than 144 countries. And then we are safeguarding a humanitarian buffer of vaccines for the migrants and refugees in the conflict or fragile settings where the uh, states are not able to vaccinate those populations. So there are some safeguards on, on, on these fronts. And then there are two areas that I would like to, to kind of summarize on the work of WHO, which is relevant maybe to migrants. One of them is the travel and and free movement, where we are uh, particularly with the International Health Regulations Emergency Committee, WHO calls on countries to lift or ease international traffic bans, particularly the blanket travel travel bans, and also supporting the countries not to request the proof of COVID vaccination as the only pathway to enter or exit from a country. Again, that's something has been restricting some of the uh, population movements because of global access and inequitable distribution of COVID vaccines. And also requesting every country to recognize WHO list in the emergency list of vaccines, not differentiating from from those ones. And there are some effects on the digitalization, but uh, of course we know that from the previous panel also that is not going to resolve the whole issue. And then there are a number of member states driven political initiatives to strengthen the uh, global health security, which we hope is going to also look into inequity, human rights, and and particularly with a special focus to vulnerable populations, migrants, refugees, IDPs, and leaving no one behind concept has been initiated by the member states. One of them is looking into the uh, WHO preparedness and, and response to health emergencies working group. This working group is reviewing all the recommendations from different external bodies and panels to be able to uh, recommend a set of uh, measures that the countries and also the international organizations, including the UN agencies needs to take. 
Then the other stream is, is the negotiations among member states, which is a World Health Assembly decision asking the countries to, to start the negotiations to be able to identify whether there is a need for a convention, agreement, or another international instrument on pandemic preparedness and response, which is then again going to strengthen the global governance for health emergencies, health security, improve the coordination and ensure the highest political commitment, which is going to hopefully ensure also the financial resources. So that work has started that that is going to continue. That's a member states driven process, but we'll be concluding taking at least uh, a period of two years to be able to give enough time to the member states uh, to reflect their opinions. And the important point here is that the, the, this negotiating body, official negotiating body is going to have some public hearings with a number of stakeholders, including the UN agencies and, and IOM is going to be among those but also a number of different uh, stakeholders. So I would like to just conclude thing that, you know, we need to work together. I think coordination at the global level has been critical and that has been proven to be quite strong in the pandemic among UN agencies, but also other associations and philanthropic organizations, as well as a broad range of partners. And uh, WHO is committed to improve the, the preparedness for emergencies, for future potential pandemics. Again, putting people at the center, particularly the vulnerable populations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that um, very rich intervention. That was a, I, I like how you started with this ambitious concept of health beyond health services, but also including prevention and giving such a rich overview of WHO action on pandemic preparedness um, and equity. And, and this importance of coordination really, really came through. So thank you for ending with that point. Um, last but not least, I want to turn to Ambassador Donoghue. Uh, could you talk a little bit about progress on the GCM and the run-up to the IMRF? And how does the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic make some of these goals harder or easier to attain? The floor is yours, Ambassador Donoghue. And you are still muted. Thank you. I okay, think. You, you can hear me now, can you? Okay. Great. Well, first of all, um, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I wanted to congratulate you on that uh, MPI IOM report. I thought it was excellent. And uh, it sets out in, in great uh, uh, detail the, the range of inequalities from, and, and vulnerabilities from, from which migrants have been suffering uh, during the, the pandemic. Um, I think that it brings into focus how far we have still to travel in relation to the inequality goal, goal 10 of the SDGs. Uh, it was no accident that we inserted migration uh, under that inequality goal or reducing inequality. Um, it is a, a fundamental matter of justice and, and equality that, that uh, migrants should be given better access to all the services that the rest of us uh, enjoy and should be uh, uh, given greater protection all around. So um, I think that we already were in trouble with goal 10 even in the last few years before the pandemic struck. And since the pandemic, it has, uh, all of these uh, inequalities have been exacerbated. I hope that this will be a top priority for the IMRF. Uh, I've, I've no doubt it will be. Um, and going on from that really, uh, the HLPF, the High Level Political Forum is another context in which we can try to address the fundamental inequalities we're talking about, suffered by migrants because of uh, COVID. We have an opportunity in the high level political forum each year, in my view, not only every four years connected with the, uh, with the IMRF, but we have an opportunity every year to draw more attention to the 
uh, to the policies required to support migrants worldwide. I mean, I have felt that perhaps more use could be made of the machinery for SDG reporting, um, both from a practical point of view in the sense that uh, the HLPF gives us an opportunity every year to talk about what countries are doing, but also perhaps from a political point of view, there may be advantage for some countries in presenting what they are actually doing on, on migration as uh, uh, something which furthers SDGs implementation. Obviously, there are some countries where uh, migration or the GCM uh, are controversial, and it might be easier for them almost to use the cover of the SDGs, which are an uncontested agenda, in order to um, recount what they're actually doing. So I see plenty of ways in which we can make creative use of the SDGs machinery in addition to the IMRF. Uh, um, I won't go into too much detail, Megan, on this now because I, I, I don't have much time. But, uh, you know, in the, the new round of the HLPF, there will be greater attention paid to cross-cutting issues. Uh, and migration, the, the role of migration in advancing the SDGs is quintessentially something of cross-cutting importance. So I would actually hope that we can, beginning this year, that we can have dedicated segments of the HLPF to the GCM and what uh, has been done and what needs to be done. Obviously, the report which will, or the progress declaration, which will go forward from the IMRF will be an important uh, uh, addition to this year's HLPF. But there's a lot more that can be done by countries nationally in their own national reviews uh, to draw attention to what they are doing on GCM. I just think it's, it's a fairly obvious um, uh, extra resource, but we need to emphasize it from time to time that the, the two processes were always meant to be complementary. That's why there are so many references to the 2030 agenda in the Global Compact and indeed in the New York Declaration before that. And dare I say, we also have in the 2030 agenda itself very clear-cut references to the links between migration and sustainable development. So I, 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 I'll leave it at that, Megan. I mean, I think that the previous speakers and yourself have brought out very clearly the range of inequalities. Um, and, I, you know, for me, this is something which must be a top priority, not only for the IMRF, but also for the High Level Political Forum this year and, and going forward. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for those concrete and, and creative ideas, including how to uh, encourage uh, greater attention to benchmarking against SDG implementation to provide political cover or a complementary process that's very important. There's a little bit of background noise. I have been instructed not to ask any follow-up questions, despite having many up my sleeve um, because of uh, how short we are on time. Uh, so I'm going to open the floor for questions and comments. And I think I'm going to hand over to Dan here, who already has a few in line. Thank you. First of all, I could thank you to all the panelists and to you. In this moment, we have the four requests for intervention. In this, uh, we'll start first to ask uh, beforehand, this is Laura Townhead, France World Committee for Consultation. Thank you. So we just, uh, yeah, thank you to the moderator. Thank you to the panelists. Um, we're glad to see this conversation here today and to see it build on the discussion in the IOM Council last year. And whilst predictability can contribute to the orderliness of migration, it does not inevitably make migration safe or regular nor does it necessarily contribute to the well-being of migrants and their communities. So we're glad to see the framing of this discussion clearly grounded in the importance of equality and human rights. And we encourage you all to keep this firmly in mind as you seek to find ways forward, including through coherence between relevant channels of work, as have been mentioned. My questions for the panelists and for all of us really are, what criteria are needed to guide human rights-based predictability in human mobility in a pandemic era, era? And how and by whom will these be determined? 
On the question of criteria, we encourage reference to the work of the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights of Migrants, OHCHR, and the UN Migration Network. For example, the recommendations in the Special Rapporteur's report on COVID provide some criteria, including undertaking independent regular reviews of any restrictions on travel adopted within the framework of emergency measures, and ensuring that any restrictions on travel do not result in denying effective access to asylum or other protection procedures under international law. On the question of how and by whom guidance will be determined, in the IOM Council, we highlighted the importance of engaging with migrants and centering their expertise and experience. And I reiterate that now. As this conversation continues, we encourage you to enable migrant participation at all levels. For example, at the national level through consultation and establishment of advisory groups, including a diverse range of migrant expertise and experience. Participatory mechanisms will not only support development of effective policy now, but will enable faster and more fluid consultation when new challenges to mobility arise. And I think, sadly, that is a when, not an if. And the IMRF offers an opportunity to pledge to establish such mechanisms. So we look to you all to ensure that this opportunity and the opportunity to contribute to enhancing human rights-based predictability and human mobility is not missed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to invite now Representative Venezuela to take the floor. They have currently not joined as panelists. Okay, then Argentina as of will follow. Argentina, please go ahead. Sí, gracias. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to say something in this such an important topic very quickly because I don't want to take too much time. I would like to say that the pandemic has um, uh, shown the capacity of governments to create, to keep causes of um, uh, migration and the traffickers had adapted very quickly to the urgent measures imposed by the countries using more dangerous routes increasing the fees and exposing migrants and refugees to the aggravated risks of the illegal traffic as violence and sexual exploitation on the other hand travel restrictions and the higher unemployment uh, rates and the increasing poverty levels are the stimuli for these trafficking networks to have more profitable with the irregular migration, including the uh, return routes. And this uh, scenario has also increased the risk for more crim crimes of uh, trafficking and smuggling of migrants. Although they are very similar, they do have different operational um, uh, factors. So therefore, we need to keep on coordinating and taking into account the common features and the different features between these two crimes. These um, restriction measures, they also have a specific impact and sometimes it is exacerbated, the impact, especially in women and uh, the uh, different migrants. That is why the international debate on this topic should include the design and implementation of a specific measures, innovative measures which will reduce this impact in the most vulnerable groups, among which we can highlight especially the uh, women in extreme poverty, indigenous people and also um, displaced women. In this regard, the Argentinian government has followed or has uh, thought about the four next guidelines to advance in the regional coordination and strengthen the fight against the illicit human trafficking in the right context to increase the exchange of information to try to identify the changes of this crime in our region to try to adopt coordinated and homogeneous policies to increase the efficacy against this crime to contribute from the human rights and to lay the basis for the equity and non-discrimination of women and the LGBTI migrant group of the region through the cross-sectionality of the gender approach in the different actions and regional policies to review the current status of data and statistics integrating variables such as the sex or gender identity, ethnic or racial origin, national origin, sex, residency and other social conditions and finally to share best practices among the different regional bodies tackling the topic of women 
girls, LGBT migrants to advance in the migration politics with the gender approach, um, trying to meet the intersectionality and the interculturality factor. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have uh, still three more requests uh, for interventions, and I would like to ask all to be short as possible, two minutes if possible. Next is Venezuela. Venezuela, please go ahead. We cannot hear you, Venezuela. Are you there? Venezuela, are you there? It seems there is a, some technical problems with Venezuela. Uh, let's go then further to Angola, and then we'll come back to Venezuela. Angola is next, please. Do we have Angola online? They are not unmuting yet. Okay, not unmuting. Japan, do we have Japan? Because this is the third that you have on list. Yes, Japan. Do you hear me? Yes, please go oh, ahead. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Kisarovic, uh, for giving me a floor. And we're also grateful to the Dr. Benton and the prominent speakers of the panel for your insightful inputs on the challenges of inequalities in human mobility affecting migrants. Indeed, human mobility around the world continues to be greatly impacted by the spread of COVID-19. This situation reminds us of the importance of the principle of leaving no one's health behind. Japan is strongly committed to realizing this principle by promoting universal health coverage and attaches great significance to ensuring equitable access to safe, effective, and the quality assured of vaccines, including in developing countries. From the human security perspective, we should reaffirm that all individuals, and in particular the vulnerable, such as migrants and the displaced people, are entitled to freedom from fear, freedom from want, and to equal opportunity to enjoy all their rights and fully develop their human potential. From this perspective, Japan has announced a contribution of 1 billion US dollars to the COVAX facility, in addition to the in-kind support of 40 million doses of vaccine. Meanwhile, an integrated vaccine system from transportation administration is necessary to further promote vaccination on the ground. In this regard, as Japan has been steadily providing last one mile support, including the development of cold chain systems. Japan also expects to see IOM leverage its rich experience in this area to play an increasingly important role in responding to the current and future pandemics. Japan believes that the UN system, especially IOM and WHO, are the primary players for deepening international cooperation for action addressing inequalities for the future of human mobility. Japan continues to be an active partner in this endeavor. I thank you. Thank you. I would like to check now, do we have more luck with Venezuela and the sound? I believe in the public of Venezuela. Floor is yours if you have a sound now. Buenos dias, me escuchan? Perfect. Good morning. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yes. Go ahead. Great. At first, we would like to thank you for the invitation to this important dialogue, which allows us to assess the current situation in a, a topic of such importance and which assessment has become even more urgent in the context of COVID-19. Uh, Venezuela has historically been a hosting country for migrants of all regions of the world, where their fundamental rights are being guaranteed 
as has the health care, which has been a priority for our government. The pandemic has imposed other dynamics to the to migration, not, so, not only for its human impact, but also of how economics have been affected, uh, slowing down the growth. These are times of solidarity and dialogue. It's important to highlight the progress that Venezuela has achieved when it comes to border management, uh, bearing in mind that the measures adopted in the con migrant controls are based on the respect of the agreements uh, complied with by the government when it comes to the assistance of people, as, as long as it does not affect the health situation of the country. Despite the sanctions that have been imposed uh, as part of the unilateral measures, which are translating to uh, human rights crimes, have allowed us to turn them into opportunities uh, that, that become rights for migrants. We have created initiatives such as the Migrant uh, Protection Roundtable. It was also, we also provided uh, information and assistance points at the borders in order to carry out tests and also to provide health care for those people affected by COVID-19. This operation uh, had the collaboration of such, uh, such agencies, such as UN agencies accredited in the country, as well as uh, tens of different organizations that provided technical assistance. This is a best practice to share since these experiences are always addressed to protecting human rights and the healthcare protection, both to nationals going back to the host can, home countries. Also, the vaccination program is generally uh, has been provided to all, regardless of the migration status, bearing in mind that access to vaccines should be considered universal. And our country has, has uh, promoted dialogue and, collab and cooperation between home and destination countries. So we are always willing to listen, to, to have bilateral and multilateral agreements and respecting the sovereignty of the countries and without ideological differences and uh, bearing in mind human rights. In Venezuela, we consider migrants uh, an engine of development in the economy and has to be based on their dignity and their human rights as an ethical commitment. And for this reason, we still support the roadmap for an orderly, safe and regular migration, which is an objective in order to reach a world peace, which we will be happy to discuss in the IMRF in May. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before we turn back the floor to Megan, I will check if Guatemala uh, can speak. I see them, see them only as attending as a panelist. Are there? Okay, it seems we have uh, some technical difficulties. With Guatemala, I would like to return back floor to Megan for a closing remarks of the panelists. Please, floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you to all of those who just spoke. There was there was some really rich interventions there. Um, I'm going to now turn to the panelists for a response to anything that they have heard today, um, including to one another's interventions, which I think we don't do enough of sometimes on these panels. Um, uh, and so, uh, yeah, I invite you to spend just two minutes on um, any reflections and and closing thoughts. Um, Ambassador Virabuter, um, the floor is yours. Uh, you are still muted, I'm afraid. Oh, and still, you switched it off and then again on. There we go. <laughs> okay, thank you again. Uh, uh, in response to the, the question back from the floor, um, right, uh, we, we, from our perspective, we think that our right to help is the basic uh, human right that all people have uh, been uh, granted. 
So um, is the responsibility of the government to, to assure, to guarantee that right? Uh, and it's not uh, only limited to their national, but to some others, uh, peoples, I mean, in particular migrants, uh, workers in their country as well. And it's the, um, the, the, the responsibility of the, our loyal Thai government as well that uh, you hear from what uh, I just uh, said uh, in, the, in the discussion before that um, the um, Royal Thai government we provide access to healthcare service to all the migrant workers uh, with regard uh, to their, their legal status. And for the predictability, I, I mean, that, um, in, for the predictability of the, the migrants, we think that uh, creating the regular pathway to the uh, MOUs with the, our uh, neighboring country is going to be the key. And that help us to have the, um, on the migration management as well, because we register uh, the migrants in the countries. And that easier for us as well to guarantee the human right for them, the right to help us uh, has just been rest. But even though the migrants in the countries did not come to, to the formal channels or the as a regular pathways, the undocumented workers can be registered and get the um, access to health services as well. So I think that uh, the, 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 the key point is that it should be the responsibility of the government to guarantee that basic right to help to all country and all people in the country, including them, uh, migrants, workers as well. Um, and but for the, the monitoring system, I think that HRC, Human Rights Councils, and all the special procedure and mandate holders, they're doing the works. But the key things on this issue is that the government should feel that it's the responsibility of the government to guarantee that right. That's uh, for the point that I'm going to respond at the time being. Thank you. Thank you so much for those um, really inspiring, thoughtful comments. Um, Dr. Imiroglu, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for these rich comments and, and also some inquiries. And, and I think I cannot agree more. I think when I started the, my intervention, I was defining health, right to health or access to health, regardless of the race, religion or ethnicity and with the particular attention to vulnerable populations, I think with the human rights and dignity. And I cannot agree more that one way of ensuring it is, is the universal health coverage as raised by Japan, ensuring access to all, all services, actually, as I said, prevention, promotion without financial difficulties. I think that will be the way uh, that once countries achieve that level, I think it's going to be critically important to, include, to, to have an inclusive coverage. Then there are certain things we, of course, do as well. I mean, like engaging the communities, community readiness and resilience for health emergencies and working with the local stakeholders and players. And we have very good examples. Some of them were addressing the migrants and, and trying to identify what their obstacles are in access to those pandemic COVID tools or any other health services and how we could overcome them. So I think we need to work all together and I can not agree more that actually the pandemic increased the inequalities and that has been particularly critical in, 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 in the travel restrictions where each and every country started to implement a different uh, set of, of recommendations and restrictions, which of course had uh, dire consequences, particularly for the migrants. 
I think the harmonization and, and the coordination is going to be critical for future so that we are better prepared and do not face the same difficulties. And in relation to that, I just want to conclude saying that we have excellent collaboration with IOM for years, which actually have been strengthened during the pandemic and also through a memorandum of understanding on the priorities are and our joint actions and collaboration. I mean, I can give a few examples that like the WHO Global Action Plan on promoting refugee and migrant health is, is an example that, that requires a coordinated effort to ensure the health and excess of health, as well as the uh, friendly, migrant friendly and, and services at the local level, looking into their needs and requirements is, is some of the areas that I could give as examples. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for these very thoughtful and rich reflections, much appreciated. Um, Ambassador Donoghue, the floor is yours for final reflections. Thank you very much, Megan. You, you can hear me, yes? <laughs> um, I think if we, if we want to see how we can enhance predictability for um, human mobility, there, there are many ways. Um, obviously, more transparent government policies, uh, uh, better coordination between individual governments, uh, uh, a, more, a more integrated approach to border management. Um, th there are quite a range of, of, of measures. More fundamentally, um, we can achieve better predictability by creating more regular pathways and, and uh, um, uh, ensuring uh, easier access for migrants to the markets and countries that they want to get into. But um, I was struck by a point that Laurel Townsend made about the, the human rights uh, dimension that we have to bear in mind. And I think Laurel was, was absolutely right. And it crossed my mind there that one of the ways in which we would probably achieve better predictability is by the use of a uh, greater use of digital technologies in order to make border management more automated and more efficient. Um, so that at one level would perhaps accelerate procedures um, and uh, be ultimately to the benefit of migrants, but hidden within that, or not so hidden perhaps, is the risk that the human rights of migrants will be uh, threatened by those very technologies. First of all, migrants who don't have access to the technologies, who are not digitally literate as it were, but then also um, the, 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 the risk of uh, data privacy not being observed, the risk of uh, a range of factors being brought in through automation, which wouldn't ordinarily be part of decision making. So, I mean, on the one hand, predictability may need uh, greater use of digital technologies in the future, but there are a lot of human rights risks uh, hidden within that. And I think um, it, that was really uh, um, that, that thought occurred to me as I was listening to Laurel. Thank you very much, Megan. That was a very rich discussion and uh, very well moderated, and I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much for those really um, those great ideas to finish with. And if I may, I just have a few uh, concluding uh, thoughts to add in myself. Um, I think we've heard today that the pandemic hasn't created many of these issues with health access and, and human rights concerns. It's been a complicator and an amplifier of existing inequalities and challenges. But I was also very struck from the representative from Venezuela's point, that it's also been an opportunity for strengthening solidarity and, and dialogue. I think when it comes to health measures and mobility, um, um, I'm struck that it's important not just to see vaccination as the only pathway for entering a country, but thinking about health measures in border management as part of a comprehensive approach with multiple tools uh, for risk management and really centering the discussions about vaccine access as we've heard, rather than focusing on just vaccine verification um, and enforcement. 
Um, uh, as we think about the IMRF and future discussions on this topic uh, and moving towards a, a global architecture for mobility and pandemic preparedness, I think uh, clearly we've heard it's important to streamline the rules to improve transparency and harmonization, digitization and coordination of these rules, but also to, to mainstream equity uh, within these discussions and think about them in conjunction with um, regular pathways, for instance. And then thinking about the next steps, um, I, I like to see this conversation as, as continuing the one that we had at the IOM Council and thinking through how to take it through to the IMRF and also Ambassador Donahue's point about also using the, the high level political forum. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, everyone who participated for such a rich discussion today. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to moderate. Um, this has been a really um, um, interesting session. And I hand back to Dan at this point. Many thanks, everyone. Thank you, Megan. Thank you to all panelists. And we are now slow, slowly, but not that actually slowly, quickly transiting to the next panel. Next panel is on migration, environment, and climate change. And I would like to give the floor to our next uh, moderator. This is our colleague. I am Special Animal for Migration and Climate Change, Caroline Dumas. Caroline, please, the floor is yours. Yes, Dejan, good afternoon or good morning to, to all our, uh, to all the, the persons and the participants, our panelists and the participants. Uh, welcome for those who were not already uh, online to uh, that first session of the International Dialogue on Migration 2022. And uh, a, a, a session which is which is focusing, you know, on the global uh, com compact for migration implementation in practice, and uh, we are in day two, dedicated to facilitating regular migration, and our panel is focusing on migration, environment, and climate change, from adaptation to regular path pathways. Maybe a few words before uh, greeting our panelists. Um, this, you know, this uh, panel and the objective of this panel is to reflect the, the work in progress, all the progress in implementation, if I can say, of the commitments taken in the framework of the 2018 Global Compact commitments which were for the first time to recognize, I mean, as a reality, migration linked to climate change and uh, disasters and environmental uh, degradation. Um, the Global Compact was a follow-up, if I can say, or registers after the 2015 Paris Agreement, Sendai Framework for Disaster, uh, risk reduction, we do uh, have now, um, I mean, the, the, the duty in a certain sense, I mean, to stop, think about the implementation of the global compact. We have maybe to think on how states can develop tangible action to integrate migration and migration issues into climate change and disaster risk uh, policies, but as well the reverse and as well vice versa, how, I mean, climate um, element, climate change elements can be integrated in migration policies. So although uh, significant progress has been made to advance uh, political discussions um, on migration in the context of disasters, climate change and environmental degradation at the global level, a coherent and systematic implementation of global commitments and recommendations needs to continue to be strengthened. The panel will also discuss state pledges maybe and uh, how states can work towards more improved, more and improved regular pathways for migration in the context of disasters, climate change, environmental degradation. So to discuss these, uh, the, these important themes today, I am uh, happy to to greet several, I mean, several panelists. 
we're going maybe to start, and we, we have the great honor to greet uh, Ambassador Devin Al Husseini, who is representing, representing the Egyptian uh, government. Ambassador Nevin El Hosseini is Deputy Assistant Foreign Minister for Migration, Refugees, and Combating Human Trafficking in the Egyptian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She has a long, I mean, a long career, a long diplomatic career, but she focused as well and spent several years of her career working on migration issues. She participated as well in the process leading to the adoption of the Global Compact for Migration. And um, she will present us as well uh, today, I mean, the, uh, the line and uh, the position of Egypt as future presidency of next COP, which is COP 27, happening in Sharm el -Sher in next November. So, Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you very much for your for coming. Thank you so much, Ambassador Dumas, for the uh, uh, introduction. And uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, excellencies and distinguished participants, or good morning. Um, I would like at the beginning to uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this important meeting in preparation for the first uh, review of the GCM. Um, in my presentation, I will share with you the vision of uh, Egypt on the uh, climate change migration nexus, the policy responses that we'll try to advocate in Egypt's capacity as COP27 president. Ahead of the IMRF, I wish to reiterate that Egypt is committed to a holistic and integrated approach to migration to respect the human rights and dignity of migrants and ensure that migration remains a choice, not a necessity. Climate change is already upon us. Internal and external migratory waves result from both rapid onset and slow onset events and displacement due to climate induced natural disasters and extreme weather events are consistently on the rise and its adverse effects uh, effects have become a reality for millions of people worldwide. I believe that if we do not act now to step up climate mitigation and adaptation measures, coupled with the necessary means of implementation, the number of people displaced by climate change will continue to multiply. This is particularly true for countries that are uh, the most vulnerable to climate change which paradoxically contributed least to the climate crisis, yet are the most impacted by its devastating consequences. It is estimated that by 2050, climate change could force around 216 million people out of their homes. 85.7 uh, uh, million of them are in sub-Saharan Africa. Climate change often combines with challenges such as um, um, such as uh, uh, poverty, uh, salination of uh, soil, um, uh, decline in fertility of, uh, of land. Um, and uh, for sure, this has aggravating the pre-existing socioeconomic and governance challenges in addition to peace and security threats. All these factors create complex drivers for migration and they have a multiplier effect on migration as captured in objective two of the GCM. Indeed, for many developing countries, climate change and migration are two major sustainable development issues. For a country like Egypt, for example, according to recent World Bank reports, Egypt is one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change, which is threatening the dense, densely populated Delta region due to sea level uh, uh, rise. It also faces the specters of increased water scarcity, changing uh, precipitation patterns, rising temperatures and heat waves, and declining agriculture uh, productivity. We will create, this will create a huge risk 
of displacement, as well as overseas migration in search for better livelihood uh, and, and new opportunities. The government, Egypt is committed to investing in prevention, in preventative measures and adopting to climate change to achieve food and water security, as well as creating job opportunities in the green economy and enhance international cooperation to create legal pathways for our need. The government adopted a decent life initiative that targets the lowest income villages and cities across the country, including Delta and Alexandria, that are the most vulnerable to climate change. The initiative includes a, a components for upskilling the young uh, men and women and providing a training and career uh, advice in addition to uh, job opportunities in order to prevent decisions of irregular migration out of desperation. As a host country for around 6 million migrants, Egypt is expected to receive increasing flows of persons affected by the rapid and slow onset impacts of climate change throughout Africa. Egypt is committed to advancing policy coherence to address this challenge and enhance the resilience of, the resilience of host communities. In addition to ensure the human rights of the uh, vulnerable migrants. The impact of climate change on mobility requires us to step up our collective efforts in a, a number of areas simultaneously. First, we must continue to build resilience and adapt to the adverse impacts of climate change, particularly current and short-term impacts, such as droughts, heat waves, cyclones, water scarcity, and flooding. At the country level, we need to integrate climate-related risks, including forced displacement in national planning and peace-building efforts. Having said so, it is obvious that not all countries have the capacity to do so at the level of institutional or financial capacities. Second, we need to increase support for addressing loss and damage. At COP26, the Glasgow Loss and Damage Facility was launched to support efforts to address loss and damage and increase financing, technical assistance, and capacity building. We look forward to further building on this outcome. Third, adaptation efforts need to be complemented by means of implementation and financing, as well as action to mitigate and reduce emissions from all sectors through a just transition approach. Fourth, investing in prevention and disaster preparedness, early warning systems, risk assessments, and uh, forecast models can help uh, prepare and also prevent future displacement and help communities become more res resilient and less exposed uh, to disaster risks. Doing this, doing this requires, again, more uh, uh, capacity uh, building. If it is essential to increase investment in climate smart solutions and adapt international financing structures to better link humanitarian assistance to development initiatives. Sixth, enhancing regular pathways and supporting ethical recruitment for legal migrants. And this is a very important adaptation approach as mobility can be a vehicle to creation and transfer of resources, providing new livelihood opportunities and enhance sustainable development in both countries of origin and destination. In that regard, the proliferation of negative migration narrative is a key challenge that we need to address to ensure dignified mobility. Last but not least, I think that the concept of vulnerability needs to be put at the center of current and future responses to environmental migration. The most vulnerable may be those who are unable to do uh, to move, or what we call trapped population, or those compelled to risk their lives to find a better future in order to, to develop appropriate policies to mitigate the impact of climate change. Distinguished participants, I believe that the uh, upcoming IMRF provides a golden opportunity 
to highlight the linkages between climate change, environmental degradation, and displacement. And, and we, we look forward to more concerted action to promote the robust implementation of the GCM and achieve better coherence between the climate and migration agendas. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador. Um, it was really uh, helpful to listen to uh, your government's uh, views on, uh, first of all, maybe the adverse, increasing adverse effects of uh, climate change all over the world, the risk of more displacement, uh, population displacements linked to uh, the adverse effects of climate change being one of the drivers. And I found it very interesting that you integrated as one of the important drivers, not the main one, and being I mean, climate change and um, the degradation of environment coupled with disasters, I mean, both on slow and fast onset, as you said, are multipliers to um, insecurity and vulnerability of populations. So um, we, we heard uh, clearly that you, you do think that um, the world has to, to build more resilience to help I mean, affected populations to build more resilience, to be able to adapt better. So to increase, I mean, there is a need to increase adaptation measures, preventive policies, preparedness, early warning uh, systems, to integrate all these policies in um, migration policies as well. And uh, last but not least, to enhance uh, the regular pathways to, to help mobility um, when it is necessary, mobility being uh, adaptation, of course, itself. And I do find interesting that you, you support IMRF, of course, and we will uh, wait for Egyptian uh, support to the IMRF as a good opportunity, as you said, to enhance these uh, triangular links. So um, maybe uh, we, we can go further and maybe ask you uh, one question, which would be, as well how to, to be able to measure progress on addressing precisely migration in that context of disasters, climate change. Um, how, I mean, do you think, I mean, how is your government, I mean, um, again, measuring progress or, and how do you think, and what do you think? I mean, if we think about the COP, about next COP you're going to preside over, how, what wish do you have in this measurement? How do you want the world, I mean, to be able to, to bring the proper measurement, if I can say, for, for proper, I mean, uh, handling, if I can say, of migration. Thank you. And this is a very important uh, um, question because uh, uh, evidence-based uh, policies and the data is, is, is crucial to, to guide uh, policies. Um, in, in Egypt, we have a, um, like we did like a ma mapping for the most vulnerable uh, governor rates, uh, vulnerable for climate change. Uh, we, we established an uh, early warning uh, system and uh, it is important that this is uh, followed up um, regularly and, and uh, amended uh, uh, according to, to the, the impact that, uh, that we see. I feel that the real challenge is how to uh, create a coherence or perhaps um, how to find synergies between the uh, uh, climate change uh, uh, targets uh, or, um, or or object, uh, objectives and migration uh, related ones in the GCM and sustainable development. How to to create this uh, uh, synergy between the the, the different uh, uh, indicators? Uh, I believe that this um, requires a lot of uh, 
uh, capacity building and a lot of um, uh, coordination between the different uh, ministries. I think that uh, nowadays uh, climate change is not only an issue for the ministries of environment or kind of dealing with environment per se. It, there should be like a cross-cutting way of uh, uh, looking at the, the impact of climate change from all its different uh, angles. Thank you. You're muted, sorry, Caroline. I'm very sorry, I was mute. No, thank you very much, Ambassador, for your answer, which is extremely important. And that question of the cross-cutting uh, dimension now of climate change on one side and migration uh, anyway on the other and the, 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 the points, I mean, the, the, the links, the important links between these two, I mean, uh, trends are extremely important. We'll come back maybe to your answer and to that uh, dimension after we we listen to, to our uh, other panelists. So I would like now to give the floor to um, an American voice, if I can say. I mean, we, we, we are happy uh, to greet uh, in this panel, Mrs. Aileen uh, Vadel, who is the um, Deputy Director of the Office of Population and International Migration, PRM, in the uh, State Department. American State Department. So you are, uh, Mrs. Vedel, you are the focal point for climate change and migration uh, of the Office of Population and International Migration. You are also the focal point for the GCM. So we are happy to greet you on this panel. Um, even, even more, if I can say, after uh, that very interesting and important report, which was issued by President Biden's administration a few months ago, precisely on the impact of climate change and, uh, well, its uh, consequences. So, ready to listen to you, you have the floor. <laughs> Good morning, good afternoon to you all, and thank you so much, uh, Special Envoy Dumas, for the opportunity to discuss climate and migration this morning. It truly is a pleasure to be here um, to speak on a topic of such importance and urgency. Um, as the ambassador noted, we've all witnessed in the last years how the effects of the climate, climate crisis increasingly drive mass displacement. You know, we've uh, read the World Bank's Groundswell report that notes that climate impacts could displace 216 million people within their countries by 2050. And these potential movements spotlight just how crucial it is that we act now. And as you noted last October, the White House released its report on the impact of climate change on migration. And the primary goal of that report was to understand the scope of the challenge and ensure that our policy responses are effective, thoughtful, and strategic. And this re report is our roadmap moving forward. And it is a whole of government effort driving policy and programming efforts today and in coming years. Efforts that we believe have the potential to have a profound effect on the climate crisis. So consistent with the GCM with con objective two, the Biden-Harris administration has redoubled efforts to minimize the adverse drivers that push people to leave their countries of origin, such as regional violence, corruption, economic insecurity, and the overall lack of opportunity. And we are particularly focused on addressing the impact of climate change on migration. We continue to support trusted partners to anticipate prepare and respond to climate-induced migration and displacement, and to scale up support to communities to reduce the risk of climate-related disasters and strengthen resilience to the impacts of climate change. Just in November of last year, the president announced his emergency plan for adaptation and resilience, better known as PREPARE, to help more than 500 billion people in countries adapt to and manage the impacts of climate change by 2030. 
through our work with IOM, the State Department's Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration funds programs, such as training for government officials on migration and ch climate change and capacity building programs that take a proactive approach in supporting regional, national and local coordination mechanisms to prepare for and respond to climate change, including through implementing the migrants in countries in crisis guidelines. Similarly, in line uh, with objective five, the United States also seeks to avert and respond to displacement through safe, regular migration pathways and through strengthening access to assistance and protection for people displaced by the impacts of climate change, both across borders and within their countries of origin. Although we know displacement as a result of climate change is not a, itself a basis for a claim of protection under the 1951 convention and the 67 protocol, or even US law, people fleeing their countries in the context of the adverse effects of climate change and disasters may in some instances have valid claims for refugee status. To ad better address issues of protection in the context of climate change, the United States is looking to strengthen the application of existing protection frameworks, update U.S. protection mechanisms to better accommodate people fleeing the impacts of climate change, and evaluate the need for additional legal protections for those who have no alternative, alternative but to migrate. For example, we're exploring various protection options uh, and policy tools, such as whether legislative changes to temporary protected status could bolster protection, as well as improving protection of IDPs and vulnerable migrants outside our national boundaries. On refugee resettlement policy, we have harnessed our role as co-chair with UNHCR of the annual tripartite consultations on resettlement to focus on climate-related displacement. So we are hoping that actually this summer uh, to discuss a bit further at the ATCR the possibility of incorporating climate-related implications into considerations for third country resettlement. And finally, we continue to raise the impacts of climate change on migration in multilateral bodies. We recognize the need to collectively work together to prepare for and respond to the effects of the climate crisis. On President Biden's first day in office, he rejoined the Paris Agreement. And just in December of 2021, we, in our revised national statement, we announced our support for the vision of the GCM. We've also actively re-engaged in bodies such as the Regional Conference on Migration and the Intergovernmental Consultations on Migration, Asylum, and Refugees, which we will uh, actually chair in 2023. So we look forward to the International Migration Review Forum and the opportunity to discuss more. Combating climate change is not just a US or a regional issue, but we recognize a global one. And we're committed to working with all of you, with member states, civil society, and our international partners to find opportunities to face these climate challenges together in ways that are safe, orderly, and humane. Again, it's my pleasure to be here today and I thank you. Thank you very much to you, Director. Um, it is it is really interesting. I mean, to to see how United States are uh, committed precisely. I mean, to answer uh, objective or to try to to fit in objective two of the GCM. Um, as a, I mean, to see how much you have increased I mean, your your uh, dedication, if I can say, to preventive measures, to preve preventive uh, measures, adaptation. I mean, including that emergency plan on adaptation you ju you just mentioned, and uh, to understand as well how much you you develop. I mean, your policy to um, to respect objective um, objective five as well. Um, we heard uh, your your new commitments about protection and the reflections going on on the question of protection, which which is uh, really um, interesting and encouraging, as as you say, for I mean those of uh, migrants who have no choice than than to to leave their their places or dwellings. 
Um, I'm glad that you look forward to the IMRF and we look forward uh, to um, a high level delegation from United States. We, we do, of course, uh, in IOM support totally the view that uh, that question of an intersection between climate change and uh, mobility is indeed a global subject. I mean, you, you mentioned, I mean, local, national, regional engagements, policies, and of course, uh, um, work for all for all of us, but but it is a global subject, and that uh, we will bring as well. We'll try to bring uh, up to to next COP. Thank you very much. Um, maybe you know uh, 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 another question as well. I mean to to feed that discussion and. Uh, <clears throat> I could ask you maybe, coming to, to the end, if I can say of the, the development, <clears throat> what regular pathways have your government or has your government developed or implemented precisely for migration in the context of disasters and climate change? <clears throat> yes, so that's... Um... You know, we are looking at right now, and I, I, you know, it was noted in the report, you know, of looking at the potential for a separate legal pathway, but then also looking at, you know, as I noted about the temporary protected status, about, you know, what would be sort of the climate consider. I mean, we already use, um, we call it TPS. Uh, we already use that in um, for countries that are affected. Uh, by natural disasters, but how could that, you know, be expanded or the legislative changes that could occur to sort of make that more encompassing along with, you know, other um, regular pathways. So it's something actually right now that we are discussing. It's, you know, a lot of these, um, what has been really great about the report actually has been pulling together all of the different um, agencies within the U.S. government that climate change is not sort of on its own, that it's, you know, it touches throughout and it's being incorporated through all of the different work. So working with, you know, our partner agencies and looking at each of these. So um, that's that's exactly the conversations that we are having right now. Thank you very much to you. We might come back to you in the in the discussion. And uh, let me greet uh, maybe now another voice. And I must say, I'm really glad because it's a very feminine panel panel today, if I can say. We 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 do have another lady uh, who is the voice of um, most vulnerable that she 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 has worked with a lot in her life, Dr. Margaret Agama Agnete. Good um, good afternoon, maybe, uh, doctor. Um, you are the acting director for health and humanitarian affairs in the African Union uh, Commission. So we are very glad to 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 be able to I mean to to listen to you. You have a, a long career. Uh, having served uh, on uh, humanitarian, uh, I mean, the humanitarian side, but as well health, uh, psychological health, and uh, different other uh, dimensions. I mean, the Ghanaian armed forces, but as well different PKOs all around uh, the world before, uh, before joining uh, UNAIDS, and before joining the African Commission now today. So we're listening to you and to the views of uh, the African Union. Thank you to you. Uh, thank you very much this afternoon and thank you for the kind introduction and allow me to stand on all existing protocol um, and established protocol as I will greet also your participants at this forum. Um, the topic is quite an interesting one for me, and I think I would like to begin by introducing the fact that the Africa Union Commission, of course, is a policy-oriented uh, organization in which policies are um, adopted and endorsed by heads of state and government uh, for implication by implementation by our 55 member states. Uh, one of the key policies that has been uh, 
adopted most recently, which is important for this discussion, is the African Climate Change Strategy, which has been adopted by all of our member states and, and, and which aims to build resilience of the African continent to the negative impacts of climate change uh, with specific emphasis in order to achieve not only the SDGs, but the aspirations of Agenda 2063. Uh, the second uh, important initiative, which has also been adopted by uh, the commission and which was put together in partnership with IOM and other key partners was the Climate uh, Mobility uh, Initiative which is to support the continent to harness the potential of, potential of human mobility in the current uh, climate uh, crisis. Now, from where I sit um, on the humanitarian side, I think it's extreme, extremely important to make, have the discussion and to make the strong linkage between um, migration and uh, the humanitarian context and situation on the continent. Given that Africa holds over 80% of the climate um, humanitarian situation, 80% um, uh, of the global um, humanitarian um, situation exists in Africa. And some of this is climate induced and, as, and has re which has resulted in in forced displacement. Now, forced displacement then becomes our, uh, our entry point because then it's also linked with uh, mobility and the fact that we then have all these uh, refugees who are across the continent and often denied um, free movement. Uh, they have issues with legal identity and also have issues with um, civil re registration. Now, while the, a the African Union does have a number of policy documents to address the um, refugee uh, situation broadly, as um, which include the 1969 OAU Convention, the 2009 Kampala Convention, the uh, Continental Migration uh, Policy Framework, and so on and so forth. An area that needs uh, really to be uh, to interrogate it a little, a, um, in some depth and paid more attention is the whole area of um, migration and forced displacement, which has also resulted in increasing the refugee burden of the continent. And it is for this reason and for some of the issues that I already raised that the continent is focusing on, have, on the protocol of free movement, uh, which is to be ratified or expected to be ratified at least by 15 um, member states in order for it to come into force. And uh, this protocol currently has only been rat ratified by um, four countries, albeit that we have 43 uh, signatures and there's a need for increased advocacy in order to, uh, for this protocol to come into force, given uh, the impact that is going to have and on the, on, the, uh, on the migration situation that we are talking about and the experts here have, have delved into depth, its depth and the humanitarian uh, situation that is being experienced across the continent. Um, some in, the, in, in May of this year, the continent is going to host its second humanitarian and pledging conference. And one of the main thematic areas that shall be discussed shall be climate change, disasters, and forced displacement in Africa. We see this as an opportunity for engagement and for in-depth uh, in discussion prior to COP. Uh, 27, which we are proud that Egypt shall be hosting to interrogate the entire issue of climate change and development, climate change and, and mobility, and to establish clearly with, and find durable solutions for the, for, to address the issues that have emerged because of migration 
and as a result of uh, forced displacement and the and, and the humanitarian uh, situation that exists uh, across the continent. I think I can stop there and uh, remain open for further discussion, but I hope I've framed this in a way that will allow us to have a more in-depth discussion uh, moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, uh, doctor. Um, it is, well, it, it, it was very interesting, I mean, to listening to how, I mean, and we, we, we know it somewhat, but not so well, I mean, how Africa uh, built its own, if I can say, mechanisms of dealing with this uh, situation, mechanisms and beyond, of course, uh, real strategies. I mean, you were mentioning the climate change uh, continental, I mean, strategy plus the new uh, African uh, climate migration and migration initiative. Um, and maybe, I mean, and then the, maybe, I mean, the, um, an enforcement, I mean, a, a strengthening of and ratification of the, the protocol for uh, free movement, which is uh, an interesting uh, perspective. I find it very interesting as well that you you you, you do articulate um, the dimension of forced uh, displacement and uh, durable solutions. I mean the, the development uh, dimension and the durable solutions, uh, which are always uh, necessary as well, and on which uh, IOM is of course focusing uh, as well. So maybe my question to you would be um, maybe more focused on uh, objective five of the GCM, GCM objective five. I mean, how, um, how would the continent um, on, on, as you, you, you can see it would enhance availability and the flexibility of, of the pathways for regular uh, migration in the context of disasters and uh, climate change? What are the uh, possibilities still ahead? What needs to be done maybe in the first step at the COP or even later on? The IMRF, the COP and maybe beyond. Uh, thank you very much for this question. And um, I think there's one thing that we, we should establish is, is that a lot of migration does occur across the continent, which is, which is quite regular. And most often uh, when the question comes up about regular migration, uh, the focus is intercontinental, then on intercontinental migration, which also uh, takes place. Uh, in, in, in effect, in the context of uh, disasters and climate change, uh, the first is really to have this continental pro protocol ratified, which then would allow free movement uh, from one place to the other within the continent and, and would ease the restrictions which also take place uh, across borders. Because one of the challenges to um, force displacement and climate incidents are, are, are borders, the borders that exist across the continent. The second um, response that uh, the continent really is looking into is the establishment of the African Humanitarian Agency. Uh, our member states have an, um, an endorsed its protocol uh, plans are very well in uh, advanced, the framework is ready, and we are going, actually going through the final steps to get this agency um, established. Uh, it's, it's about time that Africa, um, given the burden um, within the continent, it is uh, about time and our leaders see it as a, necess as a necessity to have a, um, an African Union humanitarian agency to take show the leadership, the political will, and the commitment to addressing um, um, this, the, the situations which arise out of um, such incidences which are driven by climate change and other disasters. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Maybe we can come back to, to these two, um, I mean, directions and elements li uh, later on. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Doctor. I would like now to give the floor to um, a, a, an important NGO voice, if I can say, and give the floor to Katie Ober, who is a senior advocate and uh, program manager for the climate displacement program precisely at Refugees International. Uh, Katie Ober, you uh, have um, a, at least a decade of uh, experience on climate migration, displacement uh, issues, including, which is not uh, the least, uh, being one of the co-authors of the uh, very well-known uh, Groundswell report uh, preparing for interna internal climate migration. So we're ready to listen to you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador Dumas. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here and with such distinguished panelists. Um, I'd like to note, though, although my title on the screen says I represent Refugees International, I also sit here as a steering group member of the Climate Migration and Displacement Platform, and also as a participant of the Civil Society Action Committee, which recently released a paper on civil society priorities towards the 2022 International Migration and Review Forum. Uh, and I encourage folks on this call to, to read that paper. Out of the 12 key priorities, climate change features quite prominently. Uh, that's no mistake. Uh, and as the latest IPCC Working Group 2 report, on impacts, vulnerability, and adaptation underscores, we are in the midst of a climate crisis. Scientists have already observed increases in the frequency and intensity of climate and weather extremes, including hot extremes on land and in the ocean, heavy precipitation events, drought, and fire weather. This report also makes clear the magnitude of existing and coming climate change impacts is much larger than previously acknowledged and is already contributing to displacement and humanitarian crises around the world. Uh, for those living and working on the front lines, this, accepts, this assessment is obvious, uh, and it has become more obvious, more existential with every year and every day. Uh, and that's why civil society has been so vocal about the need to include climate change in relevant migration policy frameworks, including the GCM. Uh, in fact, civil society is responsible for important touch points within the GCM that are related to climate change, including, but not limited to objective two and objective five. However, the, G the GCM and these objectives, while noteworthy, still require reflection. Civil society is hopeful that the IMRF may serve as an opportunity to lay out these objectives in fuller detail and with renewed commitments, including from the United States. And I'm very gratified by the presence of Ms. Waddell on this panel, and I believe it sends an important signal. Uh, first, states must be clear on what minimizing adverse drivers entails. Uh, logically, developing adaptation and resilience strategies to climate change means more adaptation planning, more disaster risk reduction, uh, especially by countries on the front lines. However, it must also be acknowledged that it means high emissions countries have the responsibility to support such endeavors financially and technically. Uh, high income countries have already pledged $100 billion per year for adaptation financing under the Paris Agreement, but can this approach be reaffirmed within the GCM process? Uh, it's not just about the amount of money earmarked for adaptation. Can states pledge to increase access to long-term, multi-year, flexible funding that responds to locally defined needs and resource gaps? This understanding and framing is aligned with the goals of the grand bargain and the principles for locally led adaptation. Can states outline what responsibilities they may share related to migration in the context of climate change if these pledges aren't met? At the same time, objective two cannot be an excuse to focus solely on root causes. Even with increased investments, there are limits to adaptation. And yesterday's IPCC report made clear, we're already in the era of loss and damage or irreversible impacts due to climate change that adaptation will not adequately address. States then must determine what enhancing availability and flexibility of pathways means in this era of loss and damage. This is particularly important in the face of slow onset events. My friends and colleagues in the Pacific have requested more good faith efforts to offer bilateral or regional approaches to novel pathways, 
including resettlement and planned relocation options to other countries. This is important. At the same time, states must also strengthen existing pathways. Uh, I think the NANS and protect multiple tools to admit and protect people displaced across borders in the context of climate change do exist, such as humanitarian visas, temporary protection, immigration quotas, or free movement agreements, uh, some which have been outlined by the other speakers. But their implementation uh, is unpredictable and uneven. For example, cases of temporary admission post disaster at the complete discretion of immigration officials at the border. This has meant in the past admission has been unevenly applied based on the country of origin, race, or religion. How can states ensure that the tools they'll no doubt highlight at the IRF work in practice for those that need it most? How can they ensure that these pathways are consistent? Enhancing pathways mean more than just analyzing movement and climate change. It means more than just an opportunity to showcase existing policies. It's also an opportunity to highlight gaps and for states to be reflective and reaffirm that responsibility sharing and collective action is crucial and urgent to tackling those gaps. Thank you very much for this, um, this call as well, if I can say. Um, you raised uh, the question of the, I mean, adaptation. I mean, you're sharing um, mostly, if I can say, same views as the, the previous panelists, but you're raising um, that very important dimension, which is this financial support, but as well the technical support. So. I was thinking about maybe, or you maybe that you were thinking about the Santiago network and the concretization or operationalization, as it is said. On the financial, I mean, dimension, I I would like to retain that you you insisted that financial support beyond, I mean, all the promises which have been made up to now, I mean, the 100%, including the doubling of uh, adaptation uh, finance, uh, finance must be uh, predictable, must be flexible, and uh, must be on multi-year programs. Um, it is it is indeed extremely important to to do it uh, as much as we can when it is still time because the other important message you passed is the message on the limits to adaptation. Uh, we all heard in COP26 in Glasgow some you know a few countries from the Pacific or the Caribbean uh, region and islands telling us that it was nearly too late. So that question of accelerating adaptation as much as possible, I mean, on parallel basis to mitigation, of course, is crucial. And, uh, and then when um, displacement has to happen, enhance the pathways, as you, you, you have said. So I would like now maybe to turn, um, to open the panel, I mean, to the questions which might have uh, raised to, to each of, um, of our panelists. Um, is there, are there a few uh, questions that, uh, Dejan, you would like to, to highlight? What I could see at this moment, we don't have any requests for intervention. Uh, therefore, we'd like to invite all participants. We still have 231 participants online uh, for the questions or comments. Yes, thank you. So uh, maybe do, do our participants yes, want to uh, ask a question? I mean, either the panelists among themselves or... Um, other participants who, who might want to ask questions uh, again on that, that path, if I can say, from uh, adaptation to uh, the legal pathways precisely and regular pathways. Uh, Guatemala asking for the floor, uh, just to promote to the panelists that actually represented Guatemala can speak. Marcus, can you promote? Interesting, so it could be the voice. Yes, yes. Thank you. 
American country. Thank you. Guatemala, go ahead, please. Guatemala, you are welcome to intervene if you wish. Muchas gracias por darme la palabra. Thank you very much for giving me the floor on such an important topic, which is the impact of uh, climate change on migration, which is especially important for us. As one of the most vulnerable countries uh, to climate change, Guatemala recognizes the importance to face the structural causes that incentivize irregular migration. And for that, we consider it's essential to create programs to promote the economic development of the source communities uh, in accordance with the sustainable development goals. According to studies carried out on the causes of migration in our country, population migrates mainly due to the lack of food uh, or jobs. And to that, we add the the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change. So it's essential to implement initiatives that face the, the migration phenomenon on a comprehensive way. The adapting to climate change and sustainability are essential. And an example of this is that in our country, our country is working is with the UN system specifically for the Economic uh, Commission for Latin America on the implementation of the integral sustainability project that has created different priority projects to strengthen value chains. And it's also important to mention uh, environmental sustainability and the strengthening of the responses that allow for human mobility. Thank you very much. Thank you very, Thank you very much for, I mean, for taking the floor because it is, um, well, you, you are strengthening, if I can say, or stressing that, that, that dimension that was raised uh, of climate change as one of the drivers, but, but acting as a multiplier. I mean, you, um, you mentioned uh, um, the poverty, pobreza, uh, the, um, I mean, uh, the lack of employment, unemployment, and different other triggers for uh, migration and, and uh, forced migration. Then I found very interesting what you're uh, saying as a whole, I mean, the necessity for a whole society approach, integrating, you mentioned the private sector and SMEs. And this is very, uh, of course, very important that we have a whole uh, society approach with uh, including institutions, governments, but as well civil society, as we, we just heard, of course, plus uh, the private sector helping as well, supporting, including on the financial dimension, which was raised by our uh, last panelist, Kelly. Thank you. Are there other interventions? Yes, we have one more intervention uh, recorded, and this is representative of FAO, the Car Carvalho Kelso, please. Thank you, moderator. The new IPCC 6 assessment report points to the heightened vulnerability in rural areas due to high reliance on climate sensitive livelihoods. Climate change has negative impact on food production and food security, disproportionately affecting rural households and small scale farmers with direct and indirect implications for migration and displacement. Migration is a common adaptation strategy for rural households. Through social and financial remittances, it has the potential to strengthen households' adaptive capacity and contribute to building climate resilient livelihoods. Forced migration and migration that is undertaken via irregular pathways, on the other hand, have been shown to perpetuate vulnerability. To support migration as positive adaptation to climate change, FAO works with rural populations to address the adverse drivers of migration, promotes the sustainable use and management of natural resources, and helps create climate resilient livelihoods and green employment opportunities in rural areas. The role of migration as adaptation needs to be explicitly recognized by states and supported by creating safe and regular pathways 
for those who choose or need to move in the context of climate change. To harness the positive contribution of migration to climate change adaptation, it is critical to create enabling environments in areas of origin, transit, and destination, and recognize gender-specific needs. This will require improved coherence and coordination between sectoral policies and programming, as well as enhanced collaboration between policy actors. Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much, uh, sir, as well. It's important to have the voice of uh, the, the, the FAO and um, insisting on the fact that migration is an adaptation strategy and that it has to lead to sustainable, I mean, then development, thanks to all, I mean, the positive, of course, uh, uh, impact and the positive, I mean, um, les apports, sorry, in French, I can't find my English word, of, of migrants when they, when they are moving. You, you as well insist on the necessity of, of uh, accurate policies, I mean, to, to entrench, I mean, development uh, and the sustainability of these policies, which is, uh, which is extremely important. Um, maybe before we, we part, um, I would like to ask our panelists, each of our panelists, maybe if she has, or she has, sorry, a, a, a last message or comment on what was, uh, was said uh, in this panel, like in two minutes, a short message that you, you can send us before uh, we leave and before maybe we meet in other contexts, I hope. Thank you to you. So, so maybe uh, Ambassador Levin Al Hosseini. Um, well, uh, thank you so much. I, I really uh, appreciate the very insightful uh, 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 remarks made by all the panelists and the, 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 the participants. A few uh, ideas came uh, into my mind. The first one is the differentiated impacts on climate change. Uh, particularly for developing countries. Uh, well, 70% of the uh, uh, um, uh, countries that host refugees are developing uh, countries. So I think this is a factor that we need to take into uh, uh, consideration. And um, uh, perhaps the uh, since we're discussing refugees issues as well as forced mobility, I think it's important to emphasize uh, share, uh, burden sharing and, and uh, common responsibility mm. uh, because as the developing countries would be uh, the most affected by the impact of the climate change, uh, I think we need to ensure that there is uh, enough support for, uh, for these uh, countries. Um, it's interesting and uh, you're the, uh, the panelists uh, uh, from the Refugee International uh, was uh, uh, rightly mentioned the limits of uh, adaptation. Uh, I believe that it is very important to uh, emphasize uh, the importance of uh, prevention um, and to uh, uh, bear in mind the impact of some developmental uh, projects. Uh, the um, uh, third point is that uh, the climate change is a threat multiplier particularly in the African uh, context and its relation with the peace and security. So again, uh, we need to think again of the uh, um, uh, humanitarian, developmental, peace and security uh, nexus and uh, how does the climate change uh, uh, affect uh, th this uh, nexus? Uh, I think that's it from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to you. Yes, thank you for, for reminding us, if I can say it was said by one of our panelists, um, of that very important question of the responsibility of each, if I can say, country or group of uh, countries and uh, the peace and security nexus, of course. Uh, maybe uh, Eline Vedel, if she's still yeah, online, director, if you want to say a few words. Thank you. It has been excellent listening to everyone and just, you know, thinking about, I think, you know, what comes across so clearly is that you're in agreement on that the, you know, physical, social, economic, and environmental um, vulnerabilities um, 
combined with climate change can undermine food, water, economic security, and that, you know, we, as we hear, you know, the secondary effects of climate change are equally corrosive and spur displacement, threatening livelihoods of entire communities, weakening governments, and even in extreme cases, resulting in political instability and conflict. So, you know, for us looking forward to the IMRF, you know, we are very much interested in evidence and data-based approaches, as well as really discussing with others. And we've heard today, you know, some of the innovative approaches to mitigating the impacts of the climate crisis, both in prevention and adaptation. So we look forward to that. Thank you very much um, for this intervention as well. And uh, you're right, we all need, uh, first of all, to work on evidence and database to, to, to feed, I mean, the whole, I mean, uh, thinking about this growing uh, problem. And, and then, yes, uh, innovative responses may be as much as possible and re adapted responses precisely to each situation on each continent and each level of vulnerability towards climate, whether onset, I mean, uh, slow onset um, processes or fast onset events. Thank you very much. Um, maybe our, I mean, I don't know if Dr. If Margaret Agama is still online, maybe not. And uh, I'll give the floor to, so to Refugees International to carry over again. And I understand that Morocco would like to take the floor if we still have two minutes. So maybe... We'll lower the hand, then we can go towards the representative of Kali over. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, Kaylee. Uh, so, yeah. Kaylee Ober, and I'll come back to, to the Dr. Agama. Thank you, Ambassador. I appreciate it very much. I think I came away with two points uh, from this panel. One is that climate change is on the agenda. It's, it's imperative that we all uh, discuss this on the, and it's, it's gratifying to see the amount of engagement uh, this is receiving both at, at this dialogue and which I hope will transfer to the IMRF. Uh, I think two, we've very clearly made the links between um, different sorts of international frameworks and mechanisms that need to be um, underscored, including the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement and pledges around adaptation. And I hope that the IMRF will uh, reaffirm that and amplify that. Uh, so all in all, I feel uh, positive about sort of the developments we're seeing uh, today, especially from different member states that are on this panel. Uh, and I'm looking forward to further engaging uh, as a part of civil society. And I hope that civil society will have continue to have a strong voice in the IMRF process, especially because it holds such a such a special place within the GCM negotiations around climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very very interesting, uh, and uh, I'm happy if I can say that there is a little bit of positiveness in that uh, very heavy, uh, precisely, uh, agenda. And maybe Dr. Agama, if you wish to take the floor again for your conclusions or, I mean, small comment. Thank you very much. I shall be very brief, and thank you again for the invitation this afternoon. But just to say Africa as a continent is, in, is open for engagement around issues uh, related to climate change, migration, and humanitarian issues. And we look forward to welcoming you and hosting everybody at the um, Humanitarian Summit, which will take place in May of this year, 25th to 27th in Malabu. And of course, COP, which take 27, which will take place in Egypt later on. Um, Thank you very much, and I wish everybody all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much to you. And on that really uh, positive note, yes, I think we we can say that we, we can look forward uh, first, I mean, in the calendar to the IMRF and to amplify, as Kelly Ober said, I mean, the, these questions we were not, which were not so acute maybe in um, 2018. And this is precisely the role of the IMRF to do uh, 
uh, a review, I mean, as transparent as possible and as objective as possible to, to bring into new, new input, if I can say, in the GCM and integrate really that dimension of climate change, which has been really worsening, have a worsening impact on uh, human beings and on uh, so displacement. And so looking forward to IMRF, but looking forward to the other rendezvous that, uh, that uh, we have, yes, with that uh, humanitarian Malabo summit, uh, which will be definitely a landmark to the COP in Egypt, of course, to next COP27, where um, at least IOM would really like to see, and I understand that uh, we'll have support if I listen carefully to what you, you have told us. Um, we really would like to see some progress in, in, in the way, I mean, uh, human displacement is uh, recognized in certain sense in the whole narrative on climate change. I mean, climate change has human implications. And we do hope that these human, if I can say, implications are taken care of in the good, I mean, in, in, in the right channels in COP27 and as a global commitment or commitment by the international community. I know other, of course, important uh, subjects are on the table, which are new, new concepts as climate justice, but they are linked, they are all linked. And uh, we would say that maybe climate justice and the responsibility we heard about uh, of different parties are linked to a better, uh, a better way of accommodating, I mean, life on this planet, despite uh, the, the very, uh, very serious impact of uh, uh, an aggravating climate change. Thank you really very much to each of you, to our uh, all our participants for their patience. And I hope to have the opportunity to meet with you again in real life, if I can say, in these uh, different uh, moments ahead, in the months ahead. Thank you very much to each of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. I'd like to thank you, Carolyn, and all panelists of our last session for today. And I would like to remind everybody that tomorrow we are starting at 9 a.m. New York time or uh, 3 here Geneva time. Thank you all and see you tomorrow. Thank you very much for your help. Thank you very much for the, the, the help of the whole team, Diane. Thank you. Thank you to you.